I would now like to invite a representative from the Precision Center Youth Group to say the opening prayer. Good evening. Father, we want to thank you for the youth before us tonight. Thank you for the opportunity that you have given to them to ask questions about issues that are relevant to them. Thank you for the persons who went before them, the effort, the work they did, and the sacrifice they did, Father, in building this country. We pray that tonight, during this session, O oh Lord, that their hearts would be open to learning, that they will be thinking about their own futures and who they want to become, that they will understand the issues of responsibility, the values of justice, of hard work, O oh Lord, of giving back, that they are responsible as well in who they will become in the future. We give you thanks and honor you again Thank you for the persons who are here to facilitate this, to share. We pray that you will give wisdom, that you will give peace, O oh God, understanding, receptive hearts. We thank you for the persons who have assisted in, in setting up this event. Thank you that this has purpose behind it, is not just um, a regular event. Thank you that you have plans for it. Thank you that it's going somewhere. We thank you that it seeks to build our youth. Thank you for the value in it. We give you thanks. We honor you. For all the persons here tonight, we ask for your protection, O oh Lord, um, over them, their families, wherever they might go, that above all things, they would hear your voice and your desire for their lives for values that build character beyond what is said tonight. So again, we thank you, and in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may now be seated. On behalf of the organizing committee, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the National Youth Forum 2014. The idea to organize this forum arose not just as a result of the collaboration of seven young people with a vision, but more so because in Antigua and Barbuda, there's a generation of young people with a vision. This generation has been calling and pleading for something different in our political discourse. As a group, we are humbled that we've been able to answer that call in our own small way through this youth forum. Tonight presents us all with an opportunity. For all the youth in attendance, this forum presents you with an opportunity for you to air your views and concerns. It also provides you with an opportunity to have a voice. Tonight, you will be heard. For the panelists and the candidates in attendance, this forum presents you with an opportunity to hear what uniquely the youth issues are so that you may now understand how best to address these issues as you continue along your campaign trail. The opportunity presented tonight is not just for those present and those watching the streaming, but it's for the next generation of voters. This is a chance for the youths and the candidates of our nation to set a precedent and to display in full effect your caliber, your professionalism, and your maturity in your passion for your politics and your political issues. With that being said, we humbly request your respectful understanding of our rules and regulations. The success of this forum truly does depend on it. Tonight is about the issues, not the rhetoric. Tonight is about the substance, not the sound bites. Tonight is about discussion, despite and in spite of disagreement. This forum will present Antigua and Barbuda to the world. Tonight is Antigua's night to shine. Thank you. It is also my pleasure to welcome our MC for the evening, CEO of NIACOMS, Marcella Andre-Georges. 
Marcella Andre Georges brings over 15 years of experience in education, 15 years media experience, and seven years experience in event management, marketing, and public relations. She has a proven track record of delivering exceptional results for clients within several leading companies and sectors in Antigua, Dominica, Guadeloupe, and Anguilla, from banking and real estate to sports, telecommunications, and special entertainment projects. Known for her public speaking and excellent presentation skills, Marcella has hosted corporate, cultural, and ed educational events in Antigua and elsewhere. Marcella is a graduate of St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. She's also the CEO and founder of Niacoms, which offers communication services, social media management, and event and meeting planning. It is my distinct pleasure, and I'm sure by extension that of the um, committee, to welcome Marcella Andre Georges. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, the Honorable Baldwin Spencer, representatives of the United Progressive Party, representatives of the Antigua Labor Party, members of parliament, director of youth affairs, Cleon Athill, members of the National Youth Forum Organizing Committee, representatives of youth organizations gathered here this evening, our representatives from the media, specially invited guests, listening and viewing audiences here and abroad. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Welcome to the first National Youth Forum. This evening, whether you're part of a live audience or watching and listening via the various media platforms, you are witnessing history in the making. A particular demographic in this country, the youth, often talked at and talked about, have initiated an important dialogue with this forum during which representatives of the two main political parties will talk to them. This event dubbed a debate by some comes on the cusp of general elections a time when the nation attempts to zero in on the issues. So whether we're talking about crime and security, finance and the economy, foreign policy, women's issues, cultural and social issues, education, health, what have you, all of these issues are youth issues. The forum this evening is intended to assist in identifying and clarifying issues as outlined and presented by the growing youth demographic who were asked over the last few weeks to submit questions. The organizing committee has made every attempt to ensure transparency and to put in place measures that will ensure that the representatives of both parties have equal opportunity to respond to the questions. So to set the tone for this evening's proceedings, it will be necessary to highlight firstly the rules as have been previously stated in the press and has been agreed by both parties, youth representatives, myself, and invited members of the audience. We will also explain the format. We urge everyone present here this evening to act in accordance with these rules. As is customary in debates of this nature, the audience is prohibited from applauding at any time during the proceeding. All cell phones must be turned off. Bathroom breaks should be kept to a minimum. Outbursts and interruptions from the audience will not be tolerated, and in the event that an audience member ignores this regulation, they will be issued with a warning in the first instance and immediate removal in any future infraction. Video recording and photography is strictly prohibited except by members of the press and other authorized personnel. Again, any disregard of this regulation will be met firstly with a warning and then removal from the building. There is also a strict no entry, no re-entry policy. Anyone who opts to leave the building during the proceedings 
will not be readmitted into the building. Neither eating nor drinking is permitted inside the venue. So those are the rules. And again, we wish to reiterate that failure to comply with any of the stated rules will result in removal from the premises by security. And now we'd like to speak about the format. We will use a group debate format. The first segment will consist of eight questions posed by representatives of the various youth groups. The second segment will consist of questions submitted via social media, as well as questions from youth representatives. When called, the representative of the youth group is asked to approach the microphone and ask their question twice. Questions will also be displayed on the screen behind, behind of us here. And each party will have 10 seconds to confer or deliberate on which representative will address the question. And then they will have three minutes to respond. Any member of the group of three panelists from the party may answer the particular question. The party will have a total of three minutes to respond before the question is turned over to the other party. The party who begins the response will also end with the one minute rebuttal. The right to respond first and present a rebuttal will be alternated equally throughout the proceedings. So ladies and gentlemen, as soon as I take my seat, we will begin the debate this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, well, let us please present to you once again the panelists this evening from the United Progressive Party, Honorable Member of Parliament for St. John City East and Minister of Finance and the Economy and Public Administration, Harold Lovell. The candidate for St. Philip North, the Honorable Senator Sean Nicholas, the candidate for All Saints East and St. Luke, Honorable Senator Joanne Messiah. From the Antigua Labor Party, the candidate for St. Philip South, Honorable Sen Senator Lennox Weston. The candidate for St. Mary's South, Senator Samantha Marshall. And the candidate for St. John's City East, Mr. Melford Nicholas. As we begin, let us all note and be mindful of the words of a noted German philosopher named Albert Schweitzer. Example is not the main thing in influencing others, it is the only thing. As decided by a coin toss earlier this evening, the first question is directed at the United Progressive Party. Remember, you will have a 10 second deliberation period followed by three minutes to answer. The first question is from Sanctuary. Will the representative from Sanctuary kindly approach the microphone and ask your question? Good evening. Given the importance of the arts, which may include, but is not limited to, visual, performing, and literary art forms in preserving Antigua and Barbuda's rich cultural heritage, what is your party's stance on the promotion of the arts in Antigua and Barbuda? And what structures would you put in place to expose, train, and empower Antiguan and Barbuda artists? Given the importance of the arts, which may include, but is not limited to, visual, performing, and literary art forms in preserving Antigua and Barbuda's rich cultural heritage, what is your party's stance on the promotion of the arts in Antigua and Barbuda? And what structures would you put in place to expose, train, and empower Antiguan and Barbudan artists?
Okay, I'll open the button. Let me take this opportunity as well to say good evening, and it's a pleasure to be here. To answer the question um, specifically, the, we must first look at what exists. We have a Department of Culture that has been doing quite a bit in terms of promoting the arts. The performing arts, in terms of dance, guitar, voice training, theater arts, fine arts, in terms of their fashion and visual arts, and of course the culinary arts, where our young people are being taught how to prepare and even carry on the local uh, cuisine. The culture department takes very seriously the whole issue of documentation and research. And in so doing, the program that is in place, they are seeking to see how best they can take in young people in the culture department, as I've outlined the, fine, the three areas of the arts that they are promoting. In addition to that, they are also in the schools. And the success records have shown, for example, at the Princess Margaret School, where the theater arts are being taught, that for the past several years, they have uh, received over, one, sorry, they have received 100% passes in the theater arts. They are also known to be in the community where they are training people in visual arts, um, in voice training, and again in, in, this, in the churches. So the culture department, in spite of its many constraints, have been doing a significant job in terms of preserving our culture and promoting the arts. What next? We are mindful as a party that the arts we must preserve. So we are working with the culture department to see how we can take the program to the next level. We have done so by sending quite a number of persons overseas since the United Progressive Party administration has come to office. We think of persons like Can Cordis, persons like Victor Samuel, persons like Tavia Hunt. These are all persons who would have benefited from a United Progressive Party administration training in culture in terms of taking it further. So there is a platform that we have in place that we are building on and of course in constant uh, conversations with our young people, they too have been assisting us in how we can take this further. Just to add to that, I think it's also remarkable the progress that has been made with respect to the steel band movement. In fact, the youth steel band competition now is perhaps at its highest point ever. They've done a wonderful job in terms of bringing the art form to the people. And I think even the person who asked this question from Sanctuary, I'm sure you will note the work that has been done with many of the choirs here in Antigua and Barbuda. So I think- Thank you very much, Mr. Lovell. Your time is up. Thank you. I will read the question again for the benefit of the Antigua Labour Party, who will then have the same 10-second deliberation period, followed by three minutes to respond. Given the importance of the arts, which may include, but is not limited to, visual, performing, and literary art forms in preserving Antigua and Barbuda's rich cultural heritage, what is your party's stance on the promotion of the arts in Antigua and Barbuda? And what structures would you put in place to expose, train, and empower Antiguan and Barbudan artists? Thank you, Marcella. Let me just say good evening to um, yourself and to the listening audience. The Antiguan Barbuda Labour Party as the next government um, in terms of dealing with the issue of, of the arts recognizes that there are a number of groups such as Sanctuary and a number of steel bands um, who have developed and who continue to, to um, put out there our local talent. We are very appreciative of that, and what we recognize is that there needs to be an ongoing and continuing developed um, support within the cultural department to support our local artists here. Calypso 
We want that to continue to be a part of our culture. We want steel band to continue to develop. We want groups like Sanctuary to continue to develop and to grow. And we recognize that there is a challenge for them out there going out. And the Antigua and Barbuda Labor Party, as the next government, intends to assist them with all resources necessary to do so. We recognize that there are those who require some level of training, training that may need to be um, obtained outside of this jurisdiction. We have to be able to put those mechanisms in place to ensure that we support our young people in going out there and, and getting the necessary training. The level of exposure that groups such as the Steel Band, the Calypsonian should have internationally, because I'm sure that many of you will know that music from the Caribbean plays a significant role um, internationally and goes out there. We need to be able to ensure that we can support our Calypsonians. We need to be able to ensure that they can develop an economic base from that, um, producing their CDs and, and, and marketing that internationally. That is the sort of thing that we expect to happen as the government moving forward and supporting our young people, our local artists with the arts. Thank you very much. And we are now going to allow the United Progressive Party, who started the first response, they will have a 10 second deliberation period followed by a one minute rebuttal. As I mentioned earlier, the United Progressive Party would have built a platform for promotion of culture, preservation of the arts. And uh, we would like to add as well that just quite recently, this government would have appointed four cultural envoys in the person of Tizi, Onion, Claudette, and Tian, and three cultural ambassadors, King Shortshirt or Sir MacLean Emanuel, Sir Rupert Philo, Philo and Sir King Obstinate, uh, Paul King Obstinate Richards. And they are paid a monthly stipend by this government to help promote the art form and also to go into the schools to help build on the platform um, that we spoke about. We should also say that government's investment in Carnival, we see Carnival as a premier cultural showcase, not just for us in Antigua and Barbuda, but for the world. We take, for example, our Soka Monarch competition that is internationally renowned. Thank you very much, Senator Nicholas. And before we move on to question number two, we would just like to welcome the leader of the opposition, the Honorable Gaston Brown, and we welcome you to the first National Youth Forum. The next question comes from the under 35s of Rotary. Will the representative from the under 35s of Rotary please approach the microphone and ask your question. Besides the current technical vocational programs, what other programs will your party implement to assist those youths who are not academically inclined, but who display particular skill sets that can be developed into a viable trade? Besides the current technical vocational programs, what other programs will your party implement to assist those youths who are not academically inclined, but who display particular skill sets that can be developed into a viable trade. The Antigua Labour Party will respond first. Thank you very much for that question. The Antigua Labour Party is a party which focuses on creating opportunities for all our people. We do not see our people as artificially divided into academics and non-academics. We simply see individuals having different talent sets. And our intention is that any talent you have, whether it is in terms of formal university three-year degree, or in terms of a skill area, or sporting skill, we will provide the opportunity for training and exposure. 
we will have a program which we call a remittances program where we are going to ensure every young person who graduates from secondary school must receive at least two years of tertiary training in a skill area or in an academic area. We will send individuals abroad so they can have international certification in areas as diverse as truck operation, bulldozer operation, welding, special diving skills, electronics, and of course, in those other traditional areas. So that our policy will be to have a seamless transition from the secondary schools. You will have options to go to technical school for two years, to the state college for what they offer, or to the computer school, ABIT, for what they offer. Additionally, we're gonna provide training opportunities overseas so that every single skill set, from those who can sing, who can create revenues, and who can bring tremendous foreign exchange, as we have seen from Caribbean artists, for those who will write novels and who will be able to penetrate international markets, to those who are graphic artists, who are quite skillful, we will support you and provide you with international training and also seek out international opportunities for you to work so you can master world cutting skills and also for you to gain the confidence for starting your own business in Antigua Barbuda. So we want to assure individuals that when you look at yourself, do not consider yourself as academic or not academic. You simply look at your talent skills and you approach the Antigua Barbuda Labour Party government and we will have a program that will empower you and will provide you the life skill that can become a very important economic asset for Antigua Barbuda. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Weston. I will now read the question again for the benefit of the United Progressive Party, who will have the same 10 second deliberation period, followed by three minutes to respond. Besides the current technical vocational programs, what other programs will your party implement to assist those youths who are not academically inclined, but who display particular skill sets that can be developed into a viable trade? Thank you for your question. The government of Antigua and Barbuda recognizes that individuals are differently endowed and not everyone is academically inclined. As such, we have since 2004 promoted and developed a policy of leaving no youth behind. It is with this in mind that several initiatives have been developed and are ongoing. I speak, for example, of our recently launched EACH program, the Enterprise Achieve Challenge program, which seeks specifically to target our youth who are either low-skilled or who have no skills and who may not necessarily have completed the formal education system. In this program, we seek to train young people by placing them with uh, persons who we call experienced practitioners in areas covering plumbing, electrical repair, auto body repair, auto mechanic repair, shoe and apparel repair, etc. And what we have also done is to launch what many of you know as the GATE initiative. This is ICT focused, which arguably this government has revolutionized this sector. Under this GATE initiative, we have sought to expose our young people to a wide range of ICT platforms. Young people presently are being trained in areas such as videography, uh, um, electronic and computer repair, digital photography, programming, and a range of other subjects because we recognize that the way of the future will be ICT focused. And you don't necessarily have to uh, have completed secondary education. Some of the persons in our society who have aptitude, some, people's, some people are naturally inclined towards certain things. And so we have seen it fit to ensure 
that we are repositioning our young people uh, to take advantages for opportunities which exist within the formal and informal sectors, as well as to enable them to create opportunities for others. Thank you very much. And Thank to add also the fact that we have launched over 32, some 32 computer access centers throughout Antigua and Barbuda. This has permitted many young persons to be familiar with the new computer technologies. We have brought Antigua and Barbuda, in fact, to be the country where there is number one penetration in the entire Caribbean. Thank you very much. And uh, we are going to uh, move on to the Antigua Labour Party, who will now have the benefit of a rebuttal. And you have 10 seconds to deliberate, followed by your one minute rebuttal. Thank you. We want to just make it very clear. What we are speaking about in Antigua Labour Party is a very structured approach where we are going to mandate that all our youths must do two years of some sort of training so they can have a skill set and or academic training for pre-university. It will be a structured program where you will be trained in skill areas that suits your ability, but also which will be linked to opportunities in the job market, either here or abroad through remittances program. We have very exciting areas we have shortlisted. Areas here, new areas in the arts, for those who like to write and those who like to draw and those who like to do photography. We have brand new areas in terms of special underwater welding. We have special areas in terms of mechanics for sport racing. We have areas in terms of repair for medical equipment. We have very exciting areas and every person in sport and in music will have an opportunity. Thank you very much, Senator Weston. The next question is from the Optimist Club. And will the representative from the Optimist Club kindly approach the microphone and ask your question? Good evening. What sort of policies or plans would your party implement to reform the current rehabilitation system to have both prisoners and at-risk youth properly reformed to enable them to become productive citizens of this country upon re-entry into civil society. I repeat, what sort of policies or plans would your party implement to reform the current rehabilitation system to have both prisoners and at-risk youth properly reformed to enable them to become productive citizens of this country upon re-entry into civil society? Thank you very much. The whole question of youth in prison is one that has occupied the attention of the United Progressive Party and the government. We recognize that the whole purpose of punishment should be not only to deter crime, but also to enable persons to be reformed. Quite recently, in the prison right here in Antigua and Barbuda, we started the program where they can do CXCs. This is a very, very important initiative. Started so that it can give persons who may have found themselves on the wrong side of the law an opportunity to improve themselves and to make themselves more marketable when they leave prison. Another very interesting initiative was one where we brought sports to the prison. And there's actually a football team called HMP United. And they have been brought out to the recreation grounds. And for good behavior, they are allowed this opportunity. It gives them a chance to recognize that prison is not just about sitting in a cell and deteriorating as a person. It's also about engaging in useful and wholesome activities. We've also upgraded the prison farm. You know, there was a time when the prison farm, it was in my constituency, they used to call it jail man ground. And that was a very rudimentary and primary farm facility. Today, it is much more developed. 
they are producing food, they're making themselves useful human beings. And so I think those are initiatives that we have started and which are ongoing. But in addition to that, gender affairs, they actually have an ongoing training program in prison. And in that program, again, they are bringing people, uh, making people aware of various aspects of social and economic life, helping to reform them and bring them around. So I think these initiatives demonstrate that what we would want to do is to continue that process of recognizing the inherent humanity of those persons who find themselves in prison and to bring out and to develop the talents, the skills, and the qualities within those persons. We've been doing it and we intend to continue doing it. I would just close by saying, of course, that the spiritual programs, those are continuing and those have always played a very important role and will continue to do so. Thank you, Minister Lovell. I will now read the question again for the benefit of the Antigua Labour Party. What sort of policies or plans would your party implement to reform the current rehabilitation system to have both prisoners and at-risk youth properly reformed to enable them to become productive citizens of this country upon re-entry into civil society? Thank you. Let me first say, before we deal with rehabilitation within the prison, um, the system as it is now with an overcrowded prison, a prison that is antiquated, really, we have got to look at that. And of course, we have got to ensure that we have a proper prison in place that is there to rehabilitate persons who, un who find themselves on the unfortunate side of the law. Young persons who, for whatever reason, may have not had the opportunity of any proper guidance and have strayed somewhat, we have got to ensure that we have a proper prison that is established and, and has proper programs established to assist those young persons so that they can come out and interact and, again, contribute to society in a positive way. Secondly, we need to look at society now within the communities where we have young persons and we need to identify what are the challenges that our young people have, why it is that they may err on the side of law. We have got to give them the necessary support. We would recognize that in many, many of the instances, it is single mothers who have the challenges where their young men or young women may stray. And we have got to ensure that those young mothers are given an opportunity of ensuring that they have the proper support, the mentorship within communities. We have got to ensure that we have our public library up and open so that our young people can go and interact within the library, learn. We have got to ensure that we have community centers, that our sports um, fields and, and centers are up and running so that our young people can engage in more meaningful and productive aspects in society. But for those who do fall and who do err, we have got to be there to assist and support them. And we have to ensure that as a government, we give the necessary uh, groups, whether governmental or non-governmental. At this time, I believe we have the mustard seed, Home for Girls, which is new. We have got to give them the support to ensure that they're able to bring our young people back out, teach them the, the right things in life, help them to, to go on the straight road. We have got to ensure that the boys training school is modernized and developed. Put our young boys back out to work, teach them something. This is what needs to be done now and we cannot delay. We have delayed for too long. Thank you very much, Senator Marshall. The United Progressive Party will now have their 10-second deliberation before their one-minute rebuttal. My understanding is that we're dealing with the question of reformation in prison. Now, with regard to the facility that currently exists, the United Progressive Party government recently put out a tender options for 
a new prison facility, which will be modern, state-of-the-art. So that's on the table, and that's one of the priority areas that we will be dealing with. But I also want to add that in the current prison, and we all accept that 1735 is no palace, but even within the situation as it currently exists, we have a, an active arts and cultural program whereby you can see prisoners sometimes come out, um, they're down at the market and they're selling their art, they're selling their craft. We have an auto mechanic training program that's ongoing. And I know the Minister of National Security was recently even discussing the whole question of con conjugal um, rights whilst you're in prison. So we're looking at modernizing, but at the same time not losing the essential characteristic of a prison, which is to punish. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Lovell. The next question is from the Antigua and Barbuda Agricultural Forum for Youths. The representative from the Antigua Barbuda Agricultural Forum for Youth. Thank you. This question is directed to the Antigua Labour Party first. And remember, you will have a 10 second deliberation period, followed by your three minutes. Good night. What plans does your party wish to implement to support the development of youth in agriculture, both in practical and theoretical sense? if you should be successful in the next general election. What plans does your party wish to implement to support the development of youth in agriculture, both in a practical and theoretical sense, if you should be successful in the next general election? Uh, good evening. Let me first of all take the opportunity to say good evening to the listening and viewing audiences. The Antigua Labour Party sees agriculture as an extension, an important sector of our economy. And essentially, the participation of youth in this important economic endeavor is something that is of concern to us. What we believe is necessary to go forward is to remove some of the stigma that have been associated historically with agriculture and agricultural production. We have a thriving tourism economy. We have in excess of uh, one million visitors that come to our shores, either in the cruise ship business or silver arrivals. And that in itself brings a temporal market here for people who have to have something to eat. So there's a great opportunity here for us to increase the production of agricultural products here. We want to be able to encourage persons who are interested in agriculture, whether youth or any other person who is interested in that endeavor, to see agriculture as a business. Uh, what we believe that has plagued the market before has been this whole question of the supply chain. A major supermarket that is required to produce on its shelves regular produce on a regular basis is sometimes unable to deal with the uh, start and stop production systems that we have. And I believe that we have to revamp our whole agricultural extension policy to be able to look at uh, some key products. Uh, let's look, for example, at the production of a tertiary product that we have here, our hot sauce. Susie's hot sauce has made it into many a taste test, many international forum, but we have not been able to consistently supply that producer with the necessary ingredients through our farms. And that is because the production cycles are, are inherently weak. And so we believe that in supporting the development of farmers, supporting the development of young persons, and encouraging them to get onto a production cycle using our agricultural extension division plus the services of the Central Marketing Corporation, where we're able to give farmers guaranteed markets at guaranteed prices, we believe that we're going to be able to build some new businesses. And that will give us not only some new entrepreneurs from the agricultural sector and to give young people another opportunity to participate in the economy, but it will also give us the much needed uh, sectoral linkages with our major tourism product. Thank you very much, Senator Melford Nicholas. Pardon me? Pardon me. Senator, uh, Mr. Nicholas, your we are now going to go on to the next party, and for their benefit, I will read that question again. 
What plans does your party wish to implement to support the development of youth in agriculture, both in a practical and a theoretical sense, if you should be successful in the next general election? Thank you very much, the Antiguan Barbuda Agricultural Forum for Youth. Since 2004, the United Progressive Party administration has brought pride back to agriculture and the stakeholders in agriculture. And I wish to commend the Agricultural Forum for Youth for sticking with this sector, because a nation that cannot feed itself is no nation. I also wish to say that what we have done is that we have strengthened the agricultural program within the schools because there is a stigma attached to agriculture. And many of our young people see agriculture as a fork and hoe business. The truth is that agriculture is largely mechanized. And this United Progressive Party administration has sought to develop in a more meaningful way the relationships which we have had over the years with our regional and international partners to include AICA, Cardi, FAO. And our young people would also so appreciate that we have devised a deliberate policy which seeks to make available uh, a minimum of two acres of land for young people who desire to go into agriculture. We also have assistance from uh, both locally, from the technical level, as well as through AICA, for example, in respect of developing business plans, bankable projects, so that you can take in to a financial institution and find and obtain resources, financial resources, to, to advance uh, the plans that are available. But in moving forward, we are also seeking to bring more and more youth into the more modern aspects of agriculture, to encourage the uh, creation and uh, the development of more greenhouses so that you can better control the factors of production. We're also seeking to bring to uh, our young people the whole issue of hydroponics. Now, what next going forward? We've all heard about linkages to agriculture, but what we intend to do is to develop and strengthen, more importantly, the linkages between agriculture and tourism. We have to ensure that we will brand products specifically um, produced by our young people, produced by Antigua and Barbuda youth in agriculture, issues such as that. I also think that what we have to do is to encourage and ensure that more of our young people take place, take, participate, sorry, in these regional forums. For example, the festival in St. Croix, which we reintroduced in terms of our participation in 2006, and seven and eight won first prize. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now the Antigua Labour Party will have the opportunity to present their rebuttal. Thank you. The Antigua Labour Party wants to make it very clear. Agriculture will be an economic sector like any other. This time though, we are going to create farms where young people will have a farm, a five acre farm, that they can move on to with infrastructure in place tied to local markets and export markets. In other words, we're going to give you an opportunity to produce to a market where you can make an earning, where you can make a living like any other profession. We have targeted several products for exports and we have targeted several products for self-sufficiency. Those products will be areas in which you will get microfinancing and you will move on to a farm with the entire package you require to produce and you'll be producing to a market that will be guaranteed as well as any other sector that gets support, like tourism. Thank you very much, Senator Weston. The next question is from the Youth Ambassadors. 
Will the representative from Youth Ambassadors please approach the microphone and ask your question. This question is going to be directed first to the United Progressive Party. They will respond first. Global outcry for countries to lessen their dependence on fossil fuel and shift towards renewable energy. Having seen the negative effects of global warming and the increased push for renewable energy throughout the region, for example, wind farms in Puerto Rico and geothermal energy in Montserrat and Nevis, what policies would your party adopt if it won the next election that would see our nation lessen its reliance on fossil fuels? There is a global outcry for countries to lessen their dependence on fossil fuel and shift towards renewable energy. Having seen the negative effects of global warming and the increased push for renewable energy throughout the region, for example, wind farms in Puerto Rico and geothermal energy in Montserrat and Nevis, what policies would your party adopt if it won the next election that would see our nation lessen its reliance on fossil fuels. Thank you, National Youth Ambassador Corps. The issue of renewable energy is one which all nations are examining and taking action on in an effort to uh, combat the effects of global warming and climate change. Antigua and Barbuda and other CARICOM countries were asked to submit uh, their benchmark uh, projections for the short, medium, and long term in terms of renewable energy usage. What we have proposed is a 5% uh, by 2015, that's our short term target, 18% by 2022, medium term, and 25% by 2027 for the long term. Now, these targets are based on the, real, the, the realities of our existing situation, particularly our contractual obligations with APC and the limited resources which we have as a, a nation. We also have to measure and gauge uh, whether over time we will be able to increase these benchmarks which we have set. Now, the United Progressive Party is fully uh, committed to exploring and adapting to alternative uses of energy, but we have to understand that we must operate within a realistic time frame. What is needed at this point and what is actually ongoing is a st are stability studies to gauge the impact of and the intermittent use of the uh, renewable energy on the national grid and the ability to provide a reliable service. Because the bottom line is, when you as young people, anybody for that matter, when you get into your house and you turn on the switch, you want to have the light available. And these things are matters that we cannot take very lightly. We just don't want to call statistics, pull statistics from out of the air. The studies are being conducted and um, we expect that in the short, medium and long term, we will increase our uses of renewable energy. Yes, as you pointed out, St. Kitts, and Nevis, they're exploring geothermal energy. We also have to look at uh, the resources, as I said. We have wind, we have sun. Uh, but what has been targeted is the possibility of siting these uh, farms, the wind farms in particular, in the Crabs Peninsula. Presently between the AP Way, the Ministry of Agriculture, specifically the Lands and Surface Division, and the Energy Desk, we are looking at uh, offering a, a package to these private uh, owners of the lands in the Crabs Peninsula, because as you can well imagine, the establishment of wind farms uh, require uh, contiguous uh, and large tracts of land to ensure that that is feasible. Thank you, Senator Messiah. For the benefit of the Antigua Labour Party, the question again, there is a global outcry for countries to lessen their dependency on fossil fuel and shift towards renewable energy. 
having seen the negative effects of global warming and the increased push for renewable energy throughout the region, for example, wind farms in Puerto Rico and geothermal energy in Montserrat and Nevis, what policies would your party adopt if it won the next election that would see our nation lessen its reliance on fossil fuels? The Antigua Labour Party is seized of the global move towards renewable energy. However, we have to start with our own reality. And the reality in Antigua is, and for many of you here in this audience, you would know that your parents are crying on a daily basis because of the cost of energy. And the cost of energy is driven by the lack of performance of the Antigua Public Utilities Authority. The lack of performance is driven by the way we have actually managed our affairs within that institution. So we have to take, as a party, a very strong view towards looking firstly at lowering the costs. The Antigua Labour Party is prepared in the first year to grant the people of Antigua and Barbuda a 15% reduction in the cost of energy as it is. We have a situation where within the last two, three years, we have been aware that there has been an issue with the generation capacity of the Antigua Public Utilities Authority we have been making a public statement about that from time immemorial. And what we are saying is it is time that we should put that matter uh, on the drawing board again and to fix that problem. We have an opportunity, once we get into office, to look at what has happened with the whole Wadadley power plant. It is, if we ask ourselves the question truthfully, it is a decrepit set of equipment that cannot serve the going, ongoing needs of this country. It is added to costs and we intend to remove it. We do have a diplomatic relationship with our friends, the Chinese, and we do intend to engage them on the basis of replacing the Wadadley power plant with a modern wind generating engine. We do believe that that is going to give us an opportunity to meet the promise of reducing the energy costs on the families and on your parents. In addition to that, we are committed to a 20% use of renewable energies within the first five years. We see this as something that is an ongoing development, but in addition to that, we also have to exhibit some degree of caution. The one thing that we have known from our experience and for our business and, and, and engagement is that cutting edge technology often leads to bleeding edge. This is to say that new technologies are always plagued with obsolescence. So we have to be careful that when we make these investments in these renewable energies, that we are not faced with obsolescence in the first instance because we are rushed to the front of the pack. So we have a 20% goal in five years, and we believe that there are other opportunities that would present themselves. Our neighbor in Montserrat is looking at uh, geothermal energy, and we are going to be able to explore opportunities for working along with the Montserratians and to see whether or not there are opportunities that we can exploit the, uh, the use of, globe, of uh, sorry, geothermal energy in our national energy grid. In addition to that, we would support the whole point of having surplus private generators push back energy into the grid. But we'll Thank develop this. Thank you very time. much, Mr. Nicholas, candidate for the St. John's City East constituency. And now the United Progressive Party will have their opportunity to present the rebuttal. Youth of Antigua and Barbuda. It's very easy to pull numbers out of the hat without uh, stating where these numbers come from. Where are the feasibility studies? And what I have said is that the United Progressive Party is currently engaging in feasibility studies to get the requisite data so that we can put realistic figures out there in terms of reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. In addition to that, we have to debunk this uh, view that the United Progressive Party just continues to increase the cost of utility services. The fact of the matter is, in the 1990s, uh, the price of a barrel of oil was $17. Today, it's over $100. But, but, but what we have to understand is that that is what is driving the increases 
in the, in the utility prices. What we have to do is to look to see what we can do as individuals to reduce our reliance. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we move on to question number six that comes from Youth on the Move. This question will be directed to the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party first. And remember, you have 10 seconds to deliberate, followed by three minutes to answer. Good evening. At the current price and wage levels, a young person may find it difficult to finance the cost of owning their own home and land. Consequently, many are left at, to rent at high exorbitant prices. What feasibility and strategic plans will your party implement to address the high cost of rent in this country and to make owning your own home and land more affordable for young people? Again, at current prices and wage levels, a young person may find it difficult to finance the cost of owning their own home and land. Consequently, many are left to rent at exorbitant prices. What feasible strategic plans will your party implement to address the high cost of rent in this country and to make owning your own home and land more affordable for young people? Thank you very much, Youth of the Move. We view owning your own home as a fundamental right of every citizen, including our youths. And the Antigua Labour Party has a very exciting program where we're going to be building 500 homes in 500 days. We're building homes ranging from one-bedroom homes, two-bedroom homes, three-bedroom homes, and we will be providing financing and subsidized interest rates so that the cost of owning a home will be much lower than the exorbitant rents you face right now. All those houses will be built on at least 8,000 square feet of land, and they'll be built from local material using local builders, and they will be going to first-time homeowners. You cannot own a home unless you're working and you have an income. And one of the things we're going to tie into this home ownership is the training of our youths so they have the skills and the creation of opportunities in the offshore sector, in the finance sector, in the agricultural sector, so you can get work where your income levels will be sufficient to afford what is going to be support by mortgage prices, which are going to be less than $1,000 a month. We are targeting a subsidized interest rate of about 3 to 5%, where the government will invest in the youths, because we believe when the youths and individuals own their home, own homes, they become much more dynamic and much more committed to hold their jobs. They will put their monies in assets, which will give them value as they go further on, and they will also create the kind of demand that will drive the construction sector that will make it part of the economic recovery program. And so the land for youth will be back in full flow, but we're going to add housing, housing for those individuals who simply want a one bedroom, you'll also have that. We already have two investors who will start the very day we enter into office. And we're going to create teams of about 50 small contractors. They'll have about five to 10 workers with them. And they will receive the contract to build those homes. And so we just want to tell the young people who want to move out, and we're going to encourage you to be independent, because we find it as being quite productive, that you should keep the faith. Very shortly, the Labour Party will be taking office. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Weston. And for the benefit of the United Progressive Party, I will read that question again. At current price and wage levels, a young person may find it difficult to finance the cost of owning their own home, house, and land. Consequently, many are left to rent at exorbitant prices. 
What feasible strategic plans will your party implement to address the high cost of rent in this country and to make owning your own home and land more affordable to young people? Thank you very much. Let me congratulate Youth on the Move for that question. It's a very interesting question because precisely that issue is the matter currently being finalized by the United Progressive Party in specific terms. I don't want to get into generalities. Houses are going to be built, question is where. Funding is coming, question is from whom and how much. Local materials, which local materials? Okay. As far as that issue is concerned, we have already signed off on an agreement with a company where the principal is based in the United Kingdom. They're called Bow Panel Systems. They already are doing excellent work in the Far East. They have already arranged for two show houses to be built. They're currently being built in Lightfoot. You can go and see them. The material, very shortly, will be manufactured right here in Antigua. The material is strong, it's durable, it's sustainable, it's been tested, it's currently being used up at the Veranda Hotel, that's what it's built of. Half of Jolly Harbour is built of that. The extreme gym that you see run by Friars Hill, that's what it's built from. We're going to have a factory here, and I can tell you where. It's going to be up at Crabs Peninsula. The whole question of price, we are going to, with in partnership with this group, we're going to make homes available for young people, house and land for young people, for $150,000, where you'll be able to get a two-bedroom and a one-bathroom house built of this material, and it will cost less than $1,000 per month in terms of your mortgage. How do we know this will happen? Because we've already brought in the, the, the ECAB bank, um, the Eastern Caribbean Amalgamating, Amalgamated Bank. They're already partnering with us. They're very excited. And if you go over to Woods now, you will see the office for bow panels. And they already have 300 persons who have already signed up. Now, what's more, I want to point out that in terms of land, this administration, since 2004, has distributed 1,557 parcels of land. And the Minister of Agriculture informed me today that 65 to 70 percent of the persons who are taking that land are young people. So we're already making land available to young people. We're making infrastructure available. We're also ensuring that we'll have homes available for young people at affordable prices. That's what the United Progressive Party has in store for the young people of Antigua and Barbuda. This is not airy fairy stuff. This is the real McCoy. We have already negotiated the arrangements and we will be building homes for young people and all Antiguans and Barbudans who need homes at good, affordable prices. Thank you very much, Minister Lovell. And now the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party, you will have your 10-second deliberation followed by your one-minute rebuttal. Thank you very much. The local materials we're speaking about will be blockhouses. We want cement blockhouses. We'll be building cement blockhouses for Antiguan youths. The bow panel he's speaking about are eggshell houses, which no Antiguans will ever live in. I want to also say the United Progressive Party has spent $100 million building homes which cost over $350,000 and $250,000 to pay for. No youth, no Antiguan, no public servant, no police can afford those houses. They all stand empty. They were built by foreigners with foreign loan, and you will have to pay additional income tax if you elect them to pay for those white elephants. You can see them around Antigua and Barbuda. You go to Crabs, they have been speaking about Bo for three years. These people will never do a single home. They, are, they have simply created a nice, nice wall and nothing else. Three years, they have not come. We do not want no eggshell houses Thank at Antigua. Thank you Barbuda. so much, Senator Weston. Thank you very much. And we are now at question number seven. The next question is from LCP Industries. 
and I invite the representative from LCP Industries to approach the microphone and ask your question. Hi, good evening. Entrepreneurship is one key element which contributes to the economic and social development within a country's economy. Oh, entrepreneurship is one key element which contributes to the economic and social development within a country's economy. What fiscal and legislative policies would you propose which may increase the number of entrepreneurs within our Twin Island state? Entrepreneurship is one key element which contributes to the economic and social development within a country's economy. What fiscal and legislative policies would you propose, propose which may increase the number of entrepreneurs within our Twin Island state? Thank you very much to the LCP Industries. This is another very, very pertinent and very good question um, coming here tonight. And that's because entrepreneurship really is going to be the only means and mechanism by which we are going to create growth in our economy. It's the private sector that's going to drive growth. And young people are going to have to be in the forefront of those efforts. The Antigua and Barbuda Investment Authority, currently through the Small Business um, Department, they offer technical advice in terms of feasibility studies, in terms of making sure that you understand what your cash flow is going to be, that your marketing is in place, so that you can be successful. Because let us not fool ourselves. When you look at the worldwide average, between 6 and 7% of all small businesses fold within two years. So preparation is key. So we're currently, through the ABIA, programs like the Mind Your Business program, this allows young people to understand the basics of business, accounting, and things like that. That's critical. The other critical factor, obviously, is the access to capital. We've put in place the credit guarantee scheme, which means that if you have a bankable project, you can go to the bank. If the bank approves your loan, but you may lack the capital, perhaps you may not have any property, you may not have any savings, the government will put up 80% of the collateral. Now, it's important that you put in 20% because you must have some skin in the game. It can't be 100% because once you have even that 20%, you have a stake in ensuring that you do everything to make that succeed. So access to capital is very important for us. So I mentioned technical assistance, access to capital, and at the same time, we are going to try to concentrate current efforts into the Youth Business Trust. This is one of the initiatives that we'll be implementing once the United Progressive Party is re-elected, the Youth Business Trust. And this Youth Business Trust will be doing what the ABIA is currently doing, but it will be focusing on young people. Once again, preparation is the key, because in business, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And we see we, that, that we have a sacred duty to prepare young people for success. And that's why, through the Youth Business Trust, we'll make certain that they have all that is necessary in terms of the preparation so that they can launch themselves into successful businesses. We do not want situations where young people go into business and then in less than no time, they're out again. So I, I pay particular attention to the emphasis on successful businesses and young successful entrepreneurs. That's what we're gonna to try to create. Thank you, Minister Lovell. And for the benefit of the Antigua and Barbuda Labor Party, the question again, entrepreneurship is one key element which contributes to the economic and social development within a country's economy. What fiscal and legislative policies would you propose which may increase the number of entrepreneurs within our Twin Island state? Thank you very much for that question. Entrepreneurship requires three fundamental pillars. You must first of all have a market or demand for what you're going to be producing. You must have the skill for producing that product. And you must have access for financing. 
And if you're a youth, it's going to be quite unlikely you'll have collateral or else the rich will simply get richer. The Labour Party, therefore, will put these three pillars in place. We are going to be forming and expanding the microfinancing facilities in Antigua Barbuda. Microfinancing provides loans based on the quality of the business and it utilizes an extension program to mentor you so that you follow the plan and you pay based on the performance of your business. In other words, we'll be providing loans that do not require collateral. Secondly, we'll be identifying areas that we're going to encourage individuals to go into business where markets exist. For example, in the agricultural area, where we're going to have exports, we'll encourage you. In the building trade, where we're going to be having several construction products, we will encourage you. In the technical areas, in terms of computer-based technical work, in terms of artists, in terms of those individuals who do cultural products in music, we will encourage you. For the traditional areas, people who buy and sell, we are going to have a major thrust to creating employment so there'll be more disposable income so people can come and buy your product. We will also be forming what we call, again, the remittances program where we will be training individuals for work home and abroad. What we're saying, for example, if you take pilots, the pilots who left Caribbean Star and had no work, they were able to find jobs in Thailand, in Africa, in Japan. They work for three months, they're home for three months. And we are saying that you will not be limited only to Antigua Barbuda, but we will create and train you in skill areas that you have demand both in the Caribbean as well as internationally. We will train you for work in the world. We want to make sure you're at the cutting edge. You'll be certified, you'll have the skill base, you'll have the market, and you'll have the financing which is based on the quality of your performance and also your proposal. We want to break that shackle where only the rich can get credit and only the rich can have business. Today I met a, 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 a tailor on Corn Alley and he had such a tough time receiving credit. Thankfully, he was able to piece together and you should see his business today. He's flourishing. We want to encourage that type of business. Thank you very much, Senator Weston. And now the United Progressive Party will have their opportunity to present a rebuttal. Young people, in terms of entrepreneurship, the United Progressive Party is already doing that. Earlier we spoke of the GATE program and the EACH program. Training young people for the world of work, training you to be uh, your own bosses, training you to create opportunities for yourself. One of my favorite sayings is that the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. What has the Labour Party done in terms of empowering youth in business over the successive years that they've had in government? I can't think of five or even ten persons who were young then whom they have uh, empowered. On the issue of the no collateral loans, where is the money coming from? Which financial institution is going to do this? And you have to ask yourselves, is this a practical and realistic way to expose you to the business sector, to the world of work, where you are going to be entrepreneurs? What happens when you want to expand? Do you go back seeking for a zero uh, collateral loan again? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Senator Messiah, and we are now at the final question before we take a very short break. We're at question number eight. The next question comes from the Antigua State College Debate Society. Will you please step forward and present your question? With the rise in the number of our students furthering their education abroad and the ever-present problem of the brain drain of the brightest minds to foreign countries, how does your party intend to restructure the economy in an effort to entice individuals to return home? With the rise in the number of our students furthering their education abroad and the ever-present problem of the brain drain of the brightest minds 
to foreign countries, how does your party intend to restructure the economy in an effort to entice individuals to return home? Thank you very much. We believe that there are some important areas in which we can target the brightest minds that we have. For example, in agriculture, traditionally we produce seeds in Antigua through the traditional method. We have already had connection with a biotechnology company, so our science graduates, for example, can work at, in a world cutting lab and they can produce seeds for the entire world. We believe our financial institutions have great potential for leveraging the safe currency we have in the Caribbean, in the offshore sector, to create what we call special um, investment vehicles where international corporations can benefit from our very stable foreign currency and from our preferential and beneficial tax jurisdiction. And they can place the operations here and those who are interested in the financial sector can find work. We also believe that our building contractors can be equipped to bid on international projects. And so that those individuals in the engineering field, in the construction field, they too will have opportunities to work here and abroad. In the areas of the medical science, again, we're saying that we have opportunities for additional offshore schools. We also have opportunities for research there is tremendous amount of grants. For example, the Barbados government received over $100 million to investigate three or four different crops and different products. Those things we need to bring here. What we're going to do in manufacturing, for example, we're going to tie renewable energy, wind power, to an enclave sector where we're going to create a manufacturing base for those individuals who are going to be in chemical engineering, food technology, those who want to be in marketing and packaging, we're going to create a manufacturing enclave based on cheap power that we can exploit the CARICOM market and the special free trade arrangements we have with international bodies. Essentially then, to utilize our brain power, we will be attracting investments in finance, in biotechnology, in environmental sciences, in medical sciences, and those who like the sea, we're going to be training a lot of our pilots and our captains to captain large vessels as well as to fly. And so we believe that we will create enough opportunities in very important areas for those who are so inclined to not only study, but when they study, they will have productive employment that they can find both onshore and offshore producing products for the world market. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Weston. And for the benefit of the United Progressive Party, I will read that question again from the State College Debate Society. With the rise in the number of our students furthering their education abroad and the ever-present problem of the brain drain of the brightest minds to foreign countries, how does your party intend to restructure the economy in an effort to entice individuals to return home? Youth. Senator Weston spoke on the issue of seeds being produced in Antigua and Barbuda. What seeds? What type? The world is now focused on healthy living. We want to lessen our reliance on genetically modified foods. Currently, in terms of seed production, research is being done by CADI and the University of the West Indies on a, in a UPP administration going forward. The emphasis will be on organic production to develop a niche market in this sector. And furthermore, apart from the organic production in agriculture, agriculture will kick in as one of the links because tourism is going to drive our economy. So even if we restructure the economy, we're going to restructure it so that the characteristic now, which is high leakages and low linkages, will change. We will reduce the level of leakages and increase the level of linkages. So tourism will be the driver of the economy. But you will have backward linkages. The backward linkages will be in agriculture, making sure that we link agriculture with tourism. Fisheries, 
extending what is currently being done so that we can begin to tap the rich resources that we have out there. Forward linkages, those are the things that come as a result of a good, strong economy. And that is what we are currently doing in ICTs. We are, as I said earlier, number one in the Western Hemisphere in terms of penetration. We recently had a delegation from Papua New Guinea come to Antigua to learn how it's done. We're going to continue doing that, only we're going to do it a little better. Now, insofar as those forward linkages are concerned, ICTs will be the way of the future. And we have built a platform that is the envy not just of the Caribbean, but the envy of the world. And that's going to continue. We're going to go upward, we're going to go onward, and we're going to continue building forward linkages, backward linkages, develop tourism more, so that the economy is restructured, so that we can entice more young people to come home. And if I could just quickly add, uh, we should not fool ourselves to think that there's a situation that everyone who goes overseas to study will return home. That will never happen. What this United Progressive Party is proud of, and I hope um, later on we'll get a chance to speak to the record in education, is that we are preparing citizens of the world. So with our education program, the number of scholarships that we would have given to young people over, the, over these past 10 years, we are preparing you to take up responsibilities here in Antigua, as well as overseas. So we are preparing our young people to take your place in this global marketplace, which is no longer longer Antigua and Barbuda. So let us not fool ourselves to think that at every year all the graduates will return to Antigua and Barbuda. Our capacities overseas is just as good in helping us here just as if we are here in Antigua and Barbuda. So I thought I'll add that as well. We're building the intellectual capital of this country. Thank you very much uh, the uh, United Progressive Party and now the Antigua Barbuda Labour Party will have uh, their rebuttal. Remember, you have your 10-second deliberation. Thank you very much. How many of us know that in Antigua, Barbuda, now all the hot pepper seeds in the world is produced right here? That all the grass seeds for salty sand golfing is produced in Barbuda? How many Antiguans know all the legume seeds for feeding livestock in Africa is produced right here? What we are saying, we are going to now move from open pollination to biotechnology, where we are going to manipulate the whole genetic material, and that is a billion dollar industry. Barbados has received a hundred million US dollars that they are going to assign to the University of the West Indies in this area. We will attract marine schools for research. We will train individuals to captain large vessels and yachts. We will train doctors so we can get research grants to research here. We will have offshore financial sector for those in the financial industry. And for those in computer and telephone appliances, we are going to focus on app development Thank also you for you. Thank you so much, Senator Weston. And uh, this brings us to the end of our first segment. At this time, we are going to break for a five-minute intermission. Five minutes. And during this time, where the representatives will be escorted backstage. Please also remember that the no entry policy still applies. Bathrooms are located at the back of the room. And just to live stream via talkofantigua.com and also Observer Radio 911. Everyone is right here with us. So good evening. And we would like to thank our sponsors. The committee would really like to say how grateful they are. And at this time, we acknowledge the sponsors. They are Precision Center, this venue where we are right now, Yum Yums, Lime, Neocoms, Matthew Noyce of Dadley Designs, Malvin's Trucking, Hawkeye Security, Talk of Antigua, C Major Productions, and Kenji Drew, Paper Clips, Illuminat, Signcom, and Party Bands Are Us. These are the people who showed their confidence in what these young people were doing, and we'd like to say thank you to them this evening. 
Now, just before we go into the second set of questions, we invite you to focus on the screen of, ahead of you for a mini documentary on the National Youth Forum. And this was produced by Nkenji Drew. in June 2013 and I realized that a lot of my peers were not going to register and had decided not to vote and I thought that this was quite sad. Youth issues are unique and different to those of adults and I wanted to develop or find some way through which the politicians can hear what those youth issues were and through which the youths could feel like they had a voice and had the ears of the politicians. I thought that this would be a great idea in that youths could ask questions personally of the politicians and the politicians would get to answer. When I initially came up with the idea, I decided obviously that I can't do it alone. I contacted John White, Carla Knight, Aziza Lee, Kyle Christian, Regis Burton, and Yandy Jackson. All of them I knew to be young, upcoming professionals who, for their various reasons, were or would be an asset to putting on something like this. When the Maya approached me about this, you know, I, was, I was really happy to be a part of a process that would show that we as you are interested in politics, are interested in the development of Antigua and Barbuda, and this youth forum seems like the perfect place to display that type of tenacity. I was really interested in doing something uh, like this. Uh, I know that a couple of my friends and myself were discussing a similar initiative uh, and when I got the call to be a part of a, a, a committee to organize uh, a debate or a conversation between young people and the politicians, I immediately jumped towards it because it's something that I thought would have been a good thing for our democracy. Working with these group of guys and girls have been, I must say, amazing. I've been a part of several committees, but this, I could say, is one of the best that I've been a part of. No one in this committee you could say are the same. We, we all have different ways of thinking, uh, we all argue differently, but over time we have developed a bond that actually helps us to, to create an event that could one day make a change and better this nation. In Antigua, it seems as if you just have these 17 um, constituencies and candidates who are running and they're just saying, well, vote for me, I'm better than the next guy but not really understanding what's their philosophy, where they stand on the issues. And so having a forum, having a place where these candidates can come and explain to the electorate, especially the young members of the electorate, what their plans are, and letting us decide for ourselves, you know, which philosophy aligns best with mine and what's the vision I want for the future of Antigua and Barbuda. That's very important, and I think that the National Youth Forum is going to be the, the, the event to do that for a team. If you think about it, the Thank seven you. of us young people are the first to ever execute something of this nature in Antigua and Barbaria. And it is something that we can be proud of, that, that we have gotten two major political parties to sit down and listen to the youth of Antigua and Barbuda and listen to the issues that concern them. And that is a great thing that, that, leaves, that raises the level of discourse in Antigua and Barbuda politics. And 
that's something that we're good on in history. And I love that. We did this. We should be proud of it. Yes, you can applaud now, just here. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're going to continue now with the second part of our debate this evening. Maybe we could get some assistance from the volunteers. Okay. So the first question, we are going to continue with the format previously introduced. And uh, that stands for this segment. However, for the second half, there will be additional questions that have been submitted via the social media platforms, Facebook and Twitter. We will alternate between submissions via social media and additional questions from the youth group representatives. Again, the questions will be displayed on the screen. So. The first question in this segment is directed to the United Progressive Party. They will respond first, and it is a social media question. With the increased recognition of the rights of homosexuals globally, what views do both parties hold in the acceptance of homosexual rights and the redefinition of marriages in our Twin Island state. Further, will you decriminalize the act of buggery and remove the antiquated law from our statutes? I will read that question again. With the increased recognition of the rights of homosexuals globally, what views do both parties hold in the acceptance of homosexual rights and the redefinition of marriages in our twin island state? Further, will you decriminalize the act of buggery and remove the antiquated law from our statutes? Thank you for that question. The issue of homosexual rights, we see as a human right. And as such, we must recognize, all of us, that our individual rights and protections are enshrined in the Constitution of Antigua and Barbuda, specifically in Section 3. On the issue of buggery, it's important to acknowledge and recognize that this practice has been illegal since colonial rule. And by the 1950s, it had been enshrined in the Sexual Offenses Act. We recognize that uh, in Europe, North and South America, as well as some Asian countries, they've taken a more liberal approach uh, over the last 20 years and have sought to decriminalize uh, laws related to buggery. In 21st century Antigua and Barbuda, we believe that the question which has to be posited is how far is too far? for the state to extend its reach regarding the sexual choices and preferences of consenting adults which do not impinge on the rights and freedoms of others. The issue we recognize is both a moral one and a human rights one, as we would have said. And in this discussion, we are all called upon to be dispassionate in our uh, discourse on the matter. We also believe that the decriminalization of buggery is not one for a party to decide. This is an issue that necessitates national consultations and a national consensus as we move forward. We acknowledge that there are persons who take a very strict, traditionalist, non-liberal position on this issue. But we also recognize that there are persons in the society who take a more liberal approach to this matter and recognize and believe that the state must be limited in terms of its reach into the private homes, particularly the bedrooms of, of its citizens. And um, so, so we are prepared to engage the nation as a whole on this issue. And in engaging the nation on this issue, what's critical is that we take an open-minded view. I think we need to approach this question not with a empty mind but with an open mind adultery based on christian principles is against god's law but it's not illegal i think that's something that we want to think about on the question of of homosexual marriages however i think i can state on behalf of the political leader that the party does not 
endorse homosexual marriages. We believe that marriage is an institution created between man and woman, and that is our position. Thank you very much, the representatives from the United Progressive Party. And I will read that question again for the benefit of the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party. With the increased recognition of the rights of homosexuals globally, what views do both parties hold in the acceptance of homosexual rights and the redefinition of marriages in our twin island state? Further, will you decriminalize the act of buggery and remove the antiquated law from our statutes? Thank you. I think we must recognize that Antigua and Barbuda on a whole is a Christian society. And so when we look at issues of that nature, it is not a political party or a government alone that has to look at that matter. It has to be something in which society must look at on a whole. As it is at this time, the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party respects the rights of individuals to do whatever they wish within their private um, home and, and to make whatever personal choices that they wish to make. But we, on a whole, follow the values of the Christian upbringing. And we believe that the laws have been there on the books for some reason. Now, although we respect your privacy, we also ask that you respect our laws as they stand at this time until our laws are changed. We appreciate that there are persons who may be in relationships in which they would like to, to, to marry. Um, same-sex relations. As I said before, we do follow the Christian doctrine. And so therefore, I think that is a very um, serious position and one which, on a whole, no political party nor government could make that decision on their own. Thank you very much. And now we will give the United Progressive Party their opportunity to present a rebuttal. Remember your 10 second deliberation period. I would just like to reiterate the position already taken by my colleagues to say that this issue, of course, is a human rights issue. Uh, while we speak of the homosexual, the rights of the homosexuals, we must also be remi remi reminded of the rights of the heterosexuals, the rights of the asexuals. And what we must remember also, that Antigua and Barbuda would be a signatory to the United Nations Charter of Human Rights. So as much as we speak of rights of the majority group, we also remember that we have to speak about the minority. So in essence, it's a human rights issue that we believe it's not a party issue. It's neither red nor blue. It's how can we as a nation come together to discuss it. But the party's position is clear in terms of marriage, which is one of the areas of the question, the marriage, homosexual marriage. It's one that we would not support. But whether or not homosexuals are entitled to rights to consenting adults, that's a human right issue. Thank you very much. And our next question is also a social media question. It will be directed to the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party, who will respond first. The topic is disabilities. Statistics show that persons with disabilities are often marginalized. What does your administration intend to do to further assist in accessing employment, making streets and buildings in St. John's more disability friendly, especially since we also cater to tourists with disabilities? That question again. Statistics show that persons with disabilities are often marginalized. What does your administration intend to do to further assist in accessing employment, making streets and buildings in St. John's more disability friendly, especially since we also cater to tourists with disabilities?
Let me just say that I am, and I know that my party is very concerned about the fact that there are a number of disabled persons who feel that they play no role within society. We want to assure them here tonight that there is a role for you. Firstly, let me deal with the issue of access. Of course, it is not one that we can understand why that the laws provide for certain building codes to be put in place in terms of disability access, but yet we still have buildings built today without any proper access for the disabled. The Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party as your next government will ensure that such laws are not only strengthened but are enforced. We have a situation where a number of persons who are disabled are in need of work because although you are disabled, it does not mean that you cannot go out and contribute to the development of this economy. As a matter of fact, I think that for the first time, Antigua and Barbuda sent their first young man, Mr. Jamal Pilgrim, who was disabled, to the, National, to the Olympics to participate. That is a prime example for disabled persons to follow, to show that because you're disabled does not mean that it ends there. So the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party will ensure that we provide all necessary resources, that we provide the necessary training and programs to ensure that our disabled young people, and, and the not so young, are able to go out and work and contribute to the development of this economy. I think that there are a number of aspects that you can look at, not only in craft, but also in going out. I mean, we've had the blind school, we've seen what they can do. They have produced some of the best work in Antigua and Barbuda. We need to expand on that. We need to develop on the, on the natural talents of our disabled young men and women. We have persons, not because you're disabled doesn't mean you cannot be a business owner, you cannot have a small business. It means then that we have to ensure that we give them the necessary training, the necessary resources to ensure that they can develop their natural skills and contribute. Thank you very much, Senator Marshall. And we now return to the United Progressive Party who will present their one minute rebuttal. Oh no, we're going to, sorry, pardon me. We are now on to question 11. The, pardon me, the United Progressive Party. Let me read that question for you again. The question is, statistics show that persons with disabilities are often marginalized. What does your administration intend to do to further assist in accessing employment, making streets and buildings in St. John's more disability friendly, especially since we also cater to tourists with disabilities? Thank you very much. That question deserves to be treated um, with the sensitivity that I believe it was um, posted. Persons with disability in Antigua and Barbuda, and the Caribbean indeed in the world, have generally not been treated with the dignity that they deserve. And the United Progressive Party is committed to ensuring that we do everything to give to persons with disability the dignity that they deserve. We were very pleased last year when we were able to encourage and support the participation of Jamal at the Olympics, the Special Olympics. I think it was the first time we were having an Antiguan there. That was an important step. The Physical Planning Act is really where the nub of this lies. And we've supported the amendments to the Physical Planning Act to allow for ramps and other facilities which would make life easier for persons with disabilities. And we will continue in, ter in terms of the international conventions. We have already recognized the convention 
and we are committed to bringing it into force through ratification. I know this is a matter that is dear to the Association of Persons with Disabilities, and I can state that it is a matter that we have noted, and we will be moving forward for the full ratification of this convention. I just wanted to add and to underscore the human rights element of it, and to say that the uh, policy of the United Progressive Party is to ensure that persons living with disabilities are able to enjoy the full rights of citizenship to the, to, the, to the extent that they're able to. And in this regard, we intend to pass legislation designed to address the needs of persons living with disabilities so that they can be fully integrated into the mainstream society, they, so that they can be guaranteed uh, um, um, enjoyment of life in areas such as education, employment, health, housing, transportation, and the like. And if I may just add that when it comes to access to educate to um, employment, I think this party prides itself in that we have a number of persons who would have um, gotten employment during the, uh, the administration of this United Progressive Party government. And when they are employed, they are not employed because they are in, in disabled. It's in spite of their disability. And as we say, as a government, we see them as being differently abled rather than being disabled. Thank you very much. And now the Antigua and Barbuda Labor Party will have their opportunity to present a rebuttal. You have 10 seconds to deliberate, followed by a one minute rebuttal. Thank you very much. In terms of providing support for disabled individuals, we have done something in terms of physical and sight disability, but mental disability, we have been hopeless. We had some young mothers who have children with Down syndrome and other type of mental um, disabilities who were forced to form their own schools because the Ministry of Education refused to provide the resources to provide the special educational needs for these children. The Antigua Labour Party will develop a special needs program for these children that will be attached to our schools. And we're going to have two or three major centers with the special education to deal with these individuals. For those parents who have children who are so disabled, we're going to provide special vehicles. And we are going to guarantee employment for disabled persons because economic earning is fundamental to providing their medicine. We're going to also make medical benefits provide their medicine and their medication. Thank and you very this. much. Thank you very much, Senator Weston. And we are going to move on to question 11. It comes from the Wings Sports Club. And so we'd like to ask the representative from the Wings Sports Club to approach the microphone and ask your question, please. Should either of your parties be elected next election, how does your party propose to address the issues facing persons seeking urgent med medical attention, not only at the Mount St. John's Medical Center, but where other public health care services are provided, to ensure they receive fast, efficient, and quality Medicare, medical care? Should either of your parties be elected next election, how does your party propose to address the issues facing persons seeking urgent medical attention, not only at the Mount St. John's Medical Center, but where other public health care services are provided to ensure that they receive fast, efficient, and quality medic medical care? Thank you, Wing Sports Club. The United Progressive Party will respond first. Many thanks to the Wing Sports Club for that question. Affordable, accessible health care is something that is critical for any developing society. Antigua and Barbuda is no different. I think the question of accessible health care, first of all, must be defined with respect to 
the various stages of healthcare. There's primary healthcare, secondary, and tertiary. And I think we should also include preventive. Now, if we can begin with the preventive side, the medical benefits scheme has been doing an excellent job in terms of ensuring that persons understand the basics of healthy lifestyles. That's very important because that will reduce the need for healthcare, in healthcare intervention, either the hospital level or the clinic level. Now, as far as clinics are concerned, our policy is to develop several clinics around Antigua and Barbuda and to modernize those that currently exist. We recently built the Cedar Grove Clinic. We recently refurbished the one at Browns Avenue, the one in Clare Hall, in Grace Green, All Saints, and on the drawing board are several other clinics. The whole purpose of this is to make certain that we do not overcrowd Mount St. John's Medical Center so that for primary health care, persons know that they can go to these clinics and they can receive quality care. Now, of course, one cannot escape the fact that everything has a cost to it. And so we have to make sure that we're able to deliver these services in a cost-effective way. That's what we're trying to do currently. With, with regard to healthcare, where you need intervention at the surgical level, it will never be feasible for Antigua, Antigua and Barbuda to offer all the top specialties. Not even in some major cities in the United Kingdom and the United States, you have that. And that's because you would not have the critical mass in order to justify that type of special, specialist care. But notwithstanding that, I can say that in Antigua, we are currently developing the cancer center. There are a few challenges there, but we remain committed to developing a cancer center here in Antigua and Barbuda. And that will cater to the needs of persons with cancer, not only in Antigua, but in the entire OCS region. This type of approach, I think, where we look at the primary, the secondary, the tertiary, and the preventive is the way forward. And that's the way the United Progressive Party will address this matter. Thank you, Minister Lovell. And uh, now for the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party, I will read that question again. Should either of your parties be elected at the next election? How does your party propose to address the issues facing persons seeking urgent medical attention, not only at the Mount St. John's Medical Center, but where other public health care services are provided to ensure they receive fast, efficient, and quality medical care? Thank you very much. The Labour Party has four approaches we're going to use. The first one, of course, is that Mount St. John is now inefficient without adequate doctors because the government has refused to contribute the $2 million they budgeted for that hospital and they cannot pay their doctors. The Labour Party will prioritize health financing so doctors will be attracted, high quality doctors will be attracted to Mount St. John in all the specialization and we will use medical benefits fund, not to build sidewalks and to rent empty buildings, but to pay for quality doctors who will employ at Mount St. John. In addition, the Labour Party will expand its policy where when we were in government, we put aside $10 million and we had pre-arranged contracts with hospitals in Jamaica, Trinidad, Cuba, and in Miami. We will now expand medical benefits into a national health insurance plan. They will, with state insurance, which we will not sell, they will combine with state insurance and they will provide a national health insurance plan so that once you pay your medical benefits, it is your right, not a favor, it is your right to receive not only care at Mount St. John's, but also care at those pre-arranged institutions in the Caribbean and in North America. Every country in the world even small Turks and Caicos with 16,000 persons use their medical benefits money as a national health insurance plan. It is your money. We will convert that. We will not allow young children to be selling sweets 
and breakfasts to save their lives. Our policy is all life is precious. Everyone deserves equal access to health care. It's a fundamental principle on which the Labour Party movement is based. We will also provide scholarships not only for doctors in the first instance, but for specialization. And what we're going to do, we're going to bond these doctors for about three to five years based on the length of their scholarships to work at Mount St. John at the prices we can afford. And that will be a very important input in keeping the prices down. We demand now that they publish the medical benefits accounts. They have not been published for 10 years. And the single account we have seen, medical benefit has $40 million surplus every year. That is not used for health reasons. The financing is here. We should never allow our mother, our father, our children to be sick. And we are worried and we leave them to die because of no finances. We say we will protect and guarantee your right to health care using your own money, using state insurance, using medical benefits, and the quality academic minds we have who will train in the fine specializations we require at Mount St. John. Thank you, Senator Weston. And now the United Progressive Party, you are now, you now have your 10 second deliberation period, followed by your one minute rebuttal. I think it is just absolutely false to say that medical benefits hasn't published any accounts for over 10 years. That's simply not true. Mr. Weston can check the facts. Young people, I would like to continue as well uh, dealing with medical benefits. And some of you might be too young to know, but I will let you know that this United Progressive Party government in 2004 brought an end to the bastardization of medical benefit scheme. Funds going into the medical benefit scheme are used for their intended purposes. So that is one thing that this party, another thing that this party prides itself in. You pay your medical benefits uh, contribution, it goes towards healthcare in terms of keeping the cost of healthcare down. And in a, additionally, benefits have gone up at medical benefits. In terms of access, we just wish to add Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, now we are going to uh, continue. We are at question 12. And this question comes from social media. The topic is uh, gender affairs. Under current laws, marital rape is not recognized. And a rapist or child molester can have his sentence reduced just by admitting to the crime. What measures will be taken by your party to adjust gender-related policies? That question again. Under our current laws, marital rape is not recognized. And a rapist or child molester can have his sentence reduced just by admitting the crime. What measures will be taken by your party to adjust gender-related policies? And that question is directed now to the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party. Thank you. In relation to the issue of marital rape not being recognized, that is a concern of the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party. As a matter of fact, I myself as a member of Women Against Rape, we have been seeking to canvas the existing um, laws being changed to reflect marital rape. Unfortunately, we have not had much response from this government in relation to that issue. So we will ensure that that is a matter that is dealt with in relation to an amendment to the sexual offenses law to reflect marital rape. It is recognized within other jurisdictions as a very viable offense, one for which one can be punished significantly. And so, of course, I want to rest assured the women of Antigua and Barbuda that as a woman, I will continue to champion that cause. In relation to reduced crime, 
and um, in relation to issues pertaining to crime against gender, where one is given a reduced sentence. Well, usually the laws are drafted in such a sense that there is a maximum sentence provided, and it is up into the jurisdiction of the judge before whom one appears, who can make a determination as to whether or not they will provide the maximum sentence based upon the facts that are presented. We will look at the laws again to see what is the maximum sentence and whether that is sufficient to ensure that persons um, are properly penalized for any such crime that they are found guilty of. But what I would love to say is that we want the, women's, um, the women in Antigua and Barbuda to feel safe and secured. As a matter of fact, I think that there was a recent study done and it was found that women did something of 67% of the work but were recognized only about 16% for the contributions made in society. We want to make sure that our women are protected and any laws that are necessary to ensure that our women folk are protected, of course, we will look to strengthen those laws and to ensure that they're enforced to the fullest. But as I said, in relation to reduce sentence, that is usually within the jurisdiction of the judge who hears a matter. But it is something, of course, we will look at in relation to whether or not we need to review the, the, the maximum penalty in relation to sexual offenses against women. Thank you, Senator Marshall. And now I will read that question again for the United Progressive Party. Under current laws, marital rape is not recognized, and a rapist or child molester can have his sentence reduced just by admitting the crime. What measures will be taken by your party to adjust gender-related policies? Thank you very much for that question. I want to start by commending the staff at the Directorate of Gender Affairs for the tremendous work that they continue to do in seeking to bring comfort, to seeking to educate not only women but men because there are gender issues that affect men. And specifically on the issue of marital rape, marital rape should be recognized because rape, marital or otherwise, is an abhorrent crime. It is about power. And the simplest way I can put it is to say that no means no. No can never mean maybe. It cannot mean yes. It cannot mean that I have a ring on my finger. The fact of the matter is there are women who are in marriages who are repeatedly and continually abused and have no relief. Going forward, the United Progressive Party intends to amend the, the requisite law to ensure that the human rights elements uh, in respect of uh, gender-related issues uh, recognized and addressed in a meaningful way. And I just would like to, to suggest or to say that to the best of my knowledge and to the best of Minister Lovell's knowledge and Senator Nicholas's knowledge, any proposal by uh, the group Women Against Rape has not yet reached the cabinet. And perhaps they should seek to do so to the extent that they're very serious about making proposals on this issue. Thank you very much, United Progressive Party members. And now we return to the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party, who will present their rebuttal. Let me just add to what has been said before, because I think what we need to ensure also is that persons who are responsible for, for crimes against women and children um, are, in fact, brought before the courts. I think in order to do that, we have to ensure that we have the proper resources provided to our investigative um, team, which is the police, and that they are provided with the necessary resources so that where there are incidents of violence against women or violence against children, that those are properly reported and brought before the police. We also want to, and, and, and they're taken before the courts, and of course justice is served. We also want to ensure that although we have the, 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 the 
women's uh, gender affairs, that they provide and are given the necessary resources to assist those victims and to help them get back on their feet in society. Thank you, Senator, Senator Marshall. We move on to question 13. And this question is also from social media. And it is directed to the United Progressive Party, who will answer first. As political representatives, are you concerned with the level of access to illegal drugs and weapons among youth in both secondary schools and college? And what distinctive measures would you take to reduce such access? The question again, as political representatives, are you concerned with the level of access to illegal drug, drugs and weapons among youth in both secondary schools and college? And what distinctive measures would you take to reduce such access? Thank you for that very provocative question. The question of access to illegal drugs and weapons is one that the government, through the Ministry of National Security, continues to be very, very concerned about. Not so much because we think we should just be concerned, but because of the effect that these things have on our society, especially the question of weapons. Now, let me deal with weapons first. Weapons have been used to commit murders and commit other crimes. Happily, Antigua and Barbuda, even though one murder committed with a gun is one too many, Antigua and Barbuda still has one of the lowest crime rates in the entire Caribbean. But we need to make sure that we continue the efforts so that we stamp out access to weapons which are used to commit murders and other crimes. And so the Ministry of National Security, I know they currently have joint patrols. Those started in January of last year. And they have been extended indefinitely so that the joint patrols between the Defense Force and the police, that is continuing. We've also recently invested with a private sector partner some $2 million for CCTV cameras. And those will certainly act as a deterrent for persons who are inclined to engage in illegal activities. We want to make certain that all our interventions count. And so the question of deterrence is obviously going to be very important. And so the police have increased their patrols and with these increased patrols, it will act as a deterrent for persons who are so inclined. And so I think the question of access to illegal drugs and guns, I think it is one that will continue to concern us because the two are often linked. And the CCTV cameras, the joint patrols, and the increased patrols by the police, I think those will go a long way. I think it's also important to note the Drug Prevention Unit, which has regular programs in schools, the DEER program, so that you act not, not only to deter, but also to prevent. And so the preventive aspect of our intervention strategy, I think, has been working, and we'll continue to intensify those efforts to make certain that we eventually can rid Antigua and Barbuda of the scourge of weapons and illegal drugs. Thank you, Minister Lovell. And for the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party, I will repeat the question. As political representatives, are you concerned with the level of access to illegal drugs and weapons among youth in both secondary schools and college? And what distinctive measures would you take to reduce such access?
The Antigua Labour Party is indeed very concerned uh, with the prevalence of uh, access to these weapons and uh, to illegal substances. Uh, but I think the specific question was asked of the prevalence of them in the secondary schools and the college. I think part of the overall treatment for this uh, challenge would have to reside in an overall national crime plan, but also we have to reconceptualize the way we view our public schools. We have to reconceptualize that because I think we have outlived the centralized mode of having a single ministry of education um, where civil society, where parents and the communities in which these schools reside do not play a more meaningful role in the overall management of these facilities. We have to also understand that leadership from our standpoint is a diffused uh, endeavor, meaning to say that we have to be able to build upon the respective leadership that we have found in some of these secondary schools. I cite the Princess Margaret School in which they have exemplified themselves at finding more meaningful endeavors for the young people, particularly the young males, in that school. And so what we are we're trying to do is to look for some best practices in the schools where we can find ways and means of engaging the young people and not to see them inherently as perpetrators of crime, but they are victims of other forces that are bringing to bear, that are being brought to bear in them. The idea that we have a perpetrator of bringing drugs and these substances into the schools, it means that someone has made a conscious decision to exploit these young minds. And so we have to be concerned about that and we have to involve not just the whole question of the actions of the government through the police force or the defense force, but we also have to look about local intelligence that we can get at the level where parents and the general communities in which these schools reside can help us. That is insofar as we see the leadership role is in dealing with that. On a more practical level, we have to begin to concern ourselves with where these guns are coming from. Are our borders so porous? What is actually happening at our ports of entry? Are we not doing some of the surveillance required? Uh, as recent as perhaps maybe five, six years ago, a whole container load of, um, of munitions went missing. We still have not had any public accounting of what took place. So these are some of the areas that are of concern to us, and we are saying that it is not just the job of the constabulary and of the army, but it is the job of all of us. Our young people are being exploited at a real level for economic gain, and we have to be able to see the problem for what it is. We believe that the treatment can come by looking back at what we're doing with our schools, identifying where we have seen leadership, using those leadership models as benchmarks for us to continue the improvement. Thank you, Mr. Nicholas. And we will now hear from the United Progressive Party with their rebuttal. Early intervention in the schools is what we believe will make the difference. Children sometimes exhibit particular behavioral patterns and we need to be able to identify those patterns. Happily, the UPP at the moment, or this government, it is one of the top three priority areas for the Board of Education. In terms of the grants that are given for scholarships. Education is one of the key areas, I think is the second top priority, and counseling is one of those areas that we are encouraging persons to go off and study. Now, we have those persons who are now returning home, and it is our intention to ensure that in every single secondary school in this country, we place counselors. We're then going to move on to ensure that in... Thank you very much, Mr. Lovell. And we are now at question 14. This question will come from ABSAT, that is the Antiguan students in Trinidad and Tobago.
to transform the ASC into a full university offering tertiary education programs to Antiguans and Barbudans. How does your party intend to do this to ensure that such a university meets international accreditation standards? Further, what will you do to enhance the quality of tertiary education in the island and provide greater opportunity for access to tertiary education? The Antigua State College is regarded currently as our main institution of tertiary education. Mention has been made by, most, most, by both parties to transform the ASC into a full university offering tertiary education programs to Antiguans and Barbudans. How does your party intend to do this to ensure that such a university meets international accreditation standards? Further, what will you do to enhance the quality of tertiary education in the island and provide greater opportunity for access to tertiary education? The Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party will begin the response. Thank you very much. We have promised that we will transform the State College into a full university. And we intend to do that just as how University of the West Indies was formed. If you recall, UWE was formed first on the charter with the school from London, and then over a period of time, they became independent. We want to develop the State College in conjunction with the University of the West Indies where they expand their overseas or non-territory programs to a full university course. We want to focus, of course, on the simple areas of social science, where now you can do the first two years in Antigua Barbuda. We believe the social science is the first area. We can do the entire three years in Antigua Barbuda. And we will do that by providing PhD scholarships for our lecturers so they can get the accreditation they require to meet that requirement. In addition, we want to partner with other international schools. Another area we believe we can do very quickly is in the area of the marine sciences, where we have international schools in North America who seek external marine facilities. We will finance it in terms of looking at Board of Education. Currently, Board of Education spends only about 20% of their resources on scholarships and the book scheme. Most of Board of Education money now goes into public work activities. They have turned public works into a sidewalk creating center, and they have left the maintenance of the schools to the Board of Education. We will stop that practice, and the full 30 million collected at Board of Education, or the 25 million, that we will utilize as a major funding. So rather than giving State College a million a year, we will up that amount, making it a very important priority. Now, we do not want to give the view that we only want our children to study at home, because when you study abroad, you learn more than your courses. We want you to also have that international flavor. And so we will not only upgrade State College, but we're going to enhance its linkages with Abbott, we're going to allow Abbott to also continue and grow its linkages with these technological schools. And we're going to create, combine Abbott. We're going to combine Abbott also with the State College. And we're going to make sure that the, the resources are concentrated in a stepwise fashion. Social sciences first. Then we go to selective hard sciences. And over a period of 10, 15 years, we believe we can then go into the hard sciences, which is, of course, the most expensive area. Thank you, Senator Weston. And now we will have the United Progressive Party. They will give their response. The question is, the Antigua State College is regarded currently as our main institution of tertiary education. Mention has been made by both parties to transform the Antigua State College into a full university offering tertiary education programs to Antiguans and Barbudans. How does your party intend to do this to ensure that such a university meets international accreditation standards? Further, 
what will you do to enhance the quality of tertiary education on the island and provide greater opportunity for access to tertiary education? We thank ABSAT for that very important question. With regards to the Antigua State College, the government has already been involved in various discussions with the University of the West Indies and other universities in terms of looking at how we can transform and expand the Antigua State College in becoming a degree-granting institution. Feasibility studies have been done and they have shown that it is in fact feasible. But of course, in all of this, we have to be mindful of the whole question of accreditation. So for some people, it might not be quick enough, but we are taking our time in making sure that in all our negotiations and in all our discussions, that we would have dotted all our I's and crossed all our T's. But those discussions are very much in train. We are mindful that with the Antigua State College becoming a degree-granting institution, this will have great impact on our economy. We can only look at the example of the American University of Antigua, where in terms of our housing, transport, and other areas, business areas, where they are creating a great impact. We're also happy for this question in terms of access to education, because we have a record in education that we are very proud of. Let's look at what we've done in terms of access in education. The Prime Minister's Scholarship Committee between 2007 and 2013 would have granted 980 scholarships. The National Student Loan Fund between 2008 and 2013, 627 students would have benefited. For the Board of Education, between 2004 and 2013, 1,969 students would have benefited. And that is contrasted to 2000 and, sorry, 1994 to 2003, when the Antigua Labour Party was in, in power. And within that time, it was 961. So 961 compared to 1,000, almost 3,000, sorry. It, when we take it all into consideration, let us look at the amount spent on education. Under the United Progressive Party, we have spent $38 million to, eight, to, to date in 10 years compared to the 28 years when only $8 million was spent. So our track record on education speaks for itself. Thank you, Senator Nicholas. And now we return to the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party for their one minute rebuttal. Thank you. We just must recall that the Board of Education provides not even 10% of the cost of people studying when we say they have helped 1,000 persons. We are going to grant full scholarships to individuals so that not only those who are rich and who have collateral who can borrow money will have access to Board of Education funding. We believe it's a travesty to say to students, you can only get 10% of the funding, go and find it. Poor people's children are being left behind. We want to also say, we're speaking about forming a university of Antigua. And we are saying that the Labour Party has a very clear plan. We will link with UWE and we will provide social science full degrees within the first three years. We will then move to computer sciences and we'll work on that with the Board of Education providing their monies. They too have not provided the accounts for a long time. Thank you very much. And uh, we are now going to continue with question 15. The next question will be directed to the UPP, the United Progressive Party, who will respond first. And it is a social media question. 
and it is also the last social media question. Crime is a major problem which confronts our twin island nation. What plans are being made to ensure the safety of people who live on or visit the island? Crime is a major problem which confronts our twin island nation. What plans are being made to ensure the safety of people who live on or visit the island? Thank you for that question. I believe I touched on some of the points that I would want to make in this question. The whole question of increased patrols, the joint patrols, the CCTV cameras, those are very important. I remember in 2008 when we suffered that horrendous murder of two British tourists. It really made a very, very big um, impact, um, negative impact for our tourism industry, especially in the United Kingdom. And at that time, what we put in place was a committee to review how we would ensure the safety of our visitors. One of the things we did was to ensure that for the importation of any form of security equipment, that would come in free of any import duties and other um, taxes. So we were able to ensure that we reduce the cost and make it, more, make it easier for persons who run our own hotels to bring the necessary security equipment in. We also discussed at the same time the whole question of increasing the number of beach patrols and we put in place the beach security unit um, through the Ministry of Tourism which is still there and which is still doing a very very good job. Now at the end of the day it's going to be vigilance. Vigilance in terms of the policies that we implement, but also vigilance in terms of our citizenry. That we have to understand that tourism is our bread and butter. And it's not just for the police to make our visitors safe. Tourism is everybody's business. And so it means that every citizen has a stake in making certain that if you see something, say something. Report suspicious activities make certain that we encourage persons to continue coming to Antigua and to do so without fear that they may be attacked. I want to restate once again though that we have to be very careful if we give the impression that Antigua is not a safe place because Antigua remains one of the safest places in the world. That's just a fact. In terms of our homicide rate, it is the lowest rates in this hemisphere. In terms of other crimes, of course, and I would be the first to say, one crime is one crime too many. But we've also been encouraging the use of community um, security, using um, the community watch groups and things like that. These are the things that are going to help to curb crime for all, not just for visitors, but also for Antiguans and Barbudans. Thank you very much, United Progressive Party. And now I will read that question again for the Antigua and Barbuda Labor Party. Crime is a major problem which confronts our twin island nation. What plans are being made to ensure the safety of people who live on or visit the island? Let me just say firstly that you can really never resolve a problem unless you look at the root of the problem. And where you have an increase in crime, it is usually where you have a high level of unemployment. For the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party, we believe that it would be necessary to ensure that we encourage not only local investment, but also foreign direct investment and put our people back to work. Let me say, in relation to our actual crime plan, we need to look at the situation 
of the fact that we need more police officers. Our police officers need to be provided with the necessary resources. I believe just this week, the police has been calling out for more vehicles to be made available to assist them in carrying out their duties. We cannot delay and, 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 and indicate that we do not have the resources available to ensure that our people in Antigua and Barbuda are kept safe. We have to ensure that we encourage more police officers to become a part of the force, to, en to encourage that there are proper shift systems put in place. We need more police stations, especially in the southern part of our island. We need to ensure that we have vehicles made available for quick and rapid response. We have to ensure that we have more persons, more police officers patrolling within St. John's and within the local communities. We have to ensure that we have active community and neighborhood watch groups and that we give them all the full support as a government to ensure that they are able to act and to protect the people within their community. It is a partnership situation. It is not a situation where we sit back and we look and say, what if and what should we do? It is a situation where you must act immediately. I know that this current government um, under the Prime Minister in November of 2012 stood up in Parliament and agreed to be the chairman of a crime-fighting committee. I am not aware that they have presented any recommendations as to how we as Antiguan and Barbudans should fight crime. The Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party says we have got to make sure we put our people back to work, assist in reducing the level of crime, and then we ensure that we invest all that we can into ensuring that we have the resources made available to fight crime. We also need to ensure that where incidents of gun crimes are involved, that we will establish a gun court and laws to deal specifically with those in incidents to ensure that those persons are punished properly. Thank you very much, Senator Marshall. And now the United Progressive Party will have a minute to present a rebuttal. I want to put to rest, I want to cramp, I want to paralyze that pernicious view that there is a direct correlation between poverty and crime. It is an insult to poor people. The Prime Minister is from Grace Farm, he's not a criminal. Pastor Spencer is from a poor community, Swedes, he's not a criminal. The leader of the opposition is from Point, he's not a criminal. Fifty years ago, there was more poverty and there was less crime. Stanford is serving a jail sentence of 110 years. He was not born poor. Nothing to do with poverty. It is a crisis of values. And this crisis of values must be tackled not just by the government, but by the church, by all well-meaning citizens, and by all persons in our society as a whole. This cheap way of simply saying, oh, we're going to put people back to work and then there'll be no crime. How facile. How... My goodness me. Thank you very much, Minister Lovell. And ladies and gentlemen, we have reached our final question for the evening. And uh, that final question will be delivered by another youth group, Interact. And so we're going to ask the representative from Interact to please approach the microphone and ask your question. Good evening. There has been a general sense of apathy among young voters. What would you say to the electorate to encourage them to vote? And what positive values should be demonstrated by politicians, particularly in the public domain to youth who may wish to follow this career path? There has been a general sense of apathy among young voters. What would you say to the electorate to encourage them to vote and what positive values should be demonstrated by politicians, particularly in the public domain to youth who may wish to follow this career path? And that question will be answered by the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party in the first instance. Uh, thank you very much for that very important question, even as it comes at the end of the discourse tonight. 
I believe this forum represents a real opportunity for engagement. And I wanted to uh, encourage the, uh, the organizers of this, of this event uh, to continue doing what they're doing. It's an important engagement. Uh, the question is asked to us, why would you, what do we say to you who are apathetic? The whole point of politics, it's about your own life. It affects you. Whether or not you are engaged in it or not, it's going to affect you. Uh, the last 10 years' experience has been one where you have been affected by the politics. Even though that the United Progressive Party would like to boast of 2,000 scholarships, at the end of the day, when you have finished your studies, you want to be able to come back home to economic opportunity. And the inability of the party in power to be able to preside over the economy that is growing and has development opportunities for you, it means that you would have received a scholarship, you would have spent four or five years abroad in vain because there is no opportunity for you to come back home to. So the question here now is, where do you start the engagement? This, I say, is the first and important step. What can you continue to expect from the Antigua Labor Party? You can expect an ongoing engagement with you. We want to be able to open up ourselves to your questions and your thoughts. And we want to be able to share with you that on the team of the Antigua Labor Party are persons with practical experience drawn from a number of areas in law, in, in business, in, 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 in commerce, wherever you want to be able to examine where the skill sets are. The Antigua Labor Party has an array of persons who have had experience in government, who are aware of how to be able to execute on projects. And so we would not have a situation where we are going to promise you something like we're going to build 500 homes in 500 days and not deliver on that promise. Someone had said that um, that is not feasible. It is not feasible if we use the example now that it has taken the Antigua government nine years to finish a project of building a building. You would not think it is feasible to be able to do that. So what we want to be able to say to you is that the Antigua Labor Party is concerned at the base of all of our endeavors, whether it is to fund the healthcare system, whether it is to fund our social welfare programs, whether it is to fund the infrastructural development. It all starts with the management of the economy. If our economy is not growing, the entire country is going to be paralyzed, and we are going to see a situation where more and more the government of the day has no resources to be able to effect the promises that it has made to you. The Antigua Labor Party has a track record of being able to manage and expand your economy. Your future, your very future is at risk if you determine that you do not want to participate. As I'm saying, this is an important forum. The fact that you're here means that you want to be engaged. We want to continue to encourage that engagement and we stand ready and available at any point in time to grant you the access to what we are thinking and what our plans are. Thank you, Mr. Nicholas. And the question once again for the United Progressive Party. There has been a general sense of apathy among youth voters. What would you say to the electorate to encourage them to vote? And what positive values should be demonstrated by politicians, particularly in the public domain, to youth who may wish to follow this career path? Thank you, Interact, for that excellent question. All persons in leadership have a duty and a responsibility to lead by example. And regrettably, our political history is one which can be characterized as shameful. We have the Guns to Columbia scandal. We have the medical benefits scandal in more recent times, where a former Antigua Labor Party minister described what obtained at medical benefits as a cesspool of corruption. All of us, all of us, including you as young people, have a stake in the developmental agenda and aspirations of Antigua and Barbuda, and you must play your part. We have to remember as well that millions of people around the world do not have this right to vote, particularly women. We think of persons like Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela. I would also say that um, in terms of values of politicians, Sincerity, honesty, humility, patriotism, and commitment to improving the lives and livelihoods of all who reside in this beautiful state of Antigua and Barbuda. If I may just quickly add, 
Um, as the only new candidate, I consider myself to be here tonight. And by new, we mean would not have run in any political um, elections prior. I think I need to say this, that there has been a view, which perhaps would have led to the apathy among voters, that politicians in the past were seen as being dishonest, corrupt, and self-serving. I take myself as a personal example, where I was quite comfortable in the private sector, when I've decided to give that up to offer service to country. I do so after personal reflection on my life. What would I want young people in my community and in Antigua and Barbuda follow from what I would have done? So in terms of politics and the perception of politics, we would want to change that perception, especially you, among you young people. You look at politicians, what is it that they have to offer? Hold their feet to the fire. Performance judge on performance and if they do not perform and then so as a young new candidate I thought I had to put that in and I think it's important also to always try to discern the truth what is the truth now on the question of growth in Antigua during the period 1977 to 1994 average growth rate was just over five percent that was on the VC bird under the other leader um, the Honorable Lester Bird, between 94 and 2004 it was three percent but the highest rate of growth ever recorded in this country, as a fact, 12% in 2006 under the, United, under the United Progressive Party. And in our first five years, we achieved an average of over 6%, and we've been able to hold the economy together in the worst crisis in living memory. That's what we've done, and that's a fact. Thank you very much. And now... We are going to invite the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party to present the final rebuttal of the evening. Thank you very much. I want to just tell our audience that we have never had anywhere in the world a Minister of Finance who for four years had an economy declining by 25%. If that happened in America, they would have a riot. We want to also promise the people of this country that the Labour Party government will be a performance-based government. We are going to promise you that this view of corruption will not be an accusation. We will conduct the inquiries, and those who brought an old plant here for $250 million, we will jail them. Those who spent $800 million at public works on what we call Rata Condominium in town and who built a car park which can't park anything, we will jail them. We are going to tell you that those incompetent individuals who have destroyed our country, destroyed the opportunity, will not be talking and accusing them. We will bring them before the court, we will produce the evidence, we will lock them up, we are going to jail them. Vote for us and we will jail those crooks who destroyed our country. <laughs> Thank you very much, Senator Weston. We have now reached the end of this evening's National Youth Forum. And at this point, this brings us to the end of segment two. I will now ask each panelist, as we have arrived at the end, I will ask each panelist to give a brief individual closing statement. And uh, there is no timer here, but we would like to ask you to use your discretion and keep it to about 30 seconds, three zero thirty 30 seconds. And uh, we will begin with the panelists from the United Progressive Party. Okay, we will start with the Antigua Labour Party. We'll go first. Pardon me, we'll start with Senator Joanne Messiah. And so we'll just keep it moving this way. Thank you very much for being here, Youth of Antigua and Barbuda. I want to thank the organizers because I know this could not have been easy putting it together. I want to thank your vision, your foresight, your commitment to seeing this through. But voters of Antigua and Barbuda, you are the ones, along with others, who hold in your hand that sacred right to vote that right to determine where we're going to take our country over the next five years. We as a party, we are exceedingly proud of our record, our record in education, our record in agriculture, 
our record in sports, our record particularly in ICTs, our record in foreign affairs with the bilateral relations which we have, um, which we have developed that has inured to the benefit of a wide range of persons across Antigua and Barbuda, and our record of finance, keeping this country together in the midst and in the face of the worst global recession in 80 years. I urge you to seek the truth, to discern when you hear proposals. Thank Big you. Big sense from nonsense. You have a right to vote, and please exercise it. Thank you. And actually, in keeping with our alternating rhythms this evening, we're going to now go to the Antigua Labour Party, and I'm going to invite Mr. Melford Nicholas, the candidate for St. John City East, to give us his closing statements, and then we will return to Minister Lovell and so on. Uh, good evening again, and thank you for this opportunity. As I'd indicated, uh, the Antigua Labour Party is very pleased with this forum, with the uh, intervention made by the uh, National Youth Forum. Uh, on a whole, we believe that the upcoming general elections, and we want to say that we are hoping that with all things considered that the election will be called and scheduled. The five-year term ends on March 15th, and we want to make sure that all necessary measures are put in place so that we can have a determination by the voters, including your humble selves, uh, in terms of what is put before you. Uh, the elections, elections are always about the performance of the incumbent administration. And no amount of ranting and raging and skipping responsibility is going to preclude the fact that we have a situation here where our economy has failed to perform, the leadership of the United Progressive Party has failed this country, they have been given more public resources than any previous administration, and they have failed to produce the goods. Thank you very much, Mr. Nicholas. And we are going to return to the United Progressive Party. We would like to remind you to use your discretion and to keep it brief. These are closing statements. I just want to use this opportunity quickly to thank the National Youth Forum for this, um, allowing us tonight to have this discussion with you, the young people. And my dear young people, you would have listened to both sides. You are intelligent and you're able to discern truth and fact from fiction. The power is in your hand. You make up a significant portion of the electorate. Rise above the fray and discuss issues. Issues, my dear good people. You've listened to us. Continue the discussion. And of course, the United Progressive Party will continue its young engagement with young people as we head into the next general elections. Thank you very much, Senator Sean Nicholas. And now we return to the Antigua and Barbuda Labor Party. Senator Samantha Marshall. Let me thank the National Youth Forum for and commend them for the very hard work that they've done. I know that this being a new experience has been a significant challenge and I want to commend them because I thought tonight came off very well. Let me say to the youth and to our young women in particular, this is your time. Any decision that any government makes now is a decision that is going to affect you for the rest of your life. You are the ones who are the future of Antigua and Barbuda. We expect you to stand up. We expect you to speak out. And we commend you when you do that. We invite you to follow all the activities of the Antigua and Barbuda Labour Party as we move forward to taking governance. Thank you, Senator Marshall. And uh, finally, from the United Progressive Party, Minister Harold Lovell. Thank you very much. I would like to join with my colleagues in congratulating the organizers of this significant and historic forum. I think it has gone extremely well. And if we are to tag from the last question, I think one of the things that came out of this session was the importance of looking at the issues. But most importantly, let us remember, at the end of the day, it is not about red, it is not about blue. Young people, it is about you. Not about red, not about blue, it's about you. And I want you to always check the facts. Politicians will come, they will tell you they will cure cancer and stop climate change. They will promise you everything. Check the facts. 
I want to ask you one last time. This is your country. It's your future. And the future is in your hands. Vote for the United States. Thank you Party. very much, Mr. Lovell. And we return now to Senator Lennox Weston, who will close off our statements this evening. Thank you very much, Senator Weston. Thank, thank you very much. I would also like to congratulate the National Youth Forum for a job well done. And I would also like to encourage the youths to realize that they must check the facts. Check the fact that tourism is still below 2004 levels. Check the fact that all the hotels in Barbuda have been closed and the export of lobster and conch are down by 90%. Check the fact that we will have to find a billion dollars in the next three years to pay off debt which was incurred to fund sidewalks and projects which can't be closed. And to check the fact that the offshore sector has been closed while Barbados is making seven hundred million dollars in taxes from it. We want you to also check the fact we will do away with income tax and we will return you to work and provide you with an Antigua you. where you can be proud. Senator Thank Weston, Thank you all so much and you can now give them all a round of applause and while you're doing that I'm going to invite John White a member of the organizing committee wonderful to deliver a vote of thanks. And as we have the pleasantries up there on the stage and uh, John makes his way to the podium, allow me to congratulate the organizing team for an efficient undertaking steeped in the desire for change, backed by commitment, determination, and drive. And as I opened with a quote, I'm going to end also with a quote. And this time, the words of wisdom come from William, William Hutchinson Murray a Scottish mountaineer who dared and survived incredible and dangerous climbing expeditions. And this is specifically based on what these young people have managed to accomplish this evening. Until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. Concerning all acts of initiative and creation, there is one elementary truth that ignorance of which kills countless ideas and splendid plans. That the moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence also moves. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. A whole stream of events issues from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance, which no man could have dreamed would have come his way. Whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. Begin it now. So I'm going to say this evening, cheers to the youth. Some call you Generation Next. For accomplishing with tonight's event what many have attempted, but mostly for walking instead of talking and for taking your place at this negotiating table, otherwise called the campaign trail. So, John White. Thank you, Marcella. Now, panelists, youth groups, candidates, fellow committee members, ladies, gentlemen, friends, I am extremely proud, humbled, honored to be here at this event tonight. I know it's been a while, I know we've had a long night, but I want to say this out loud. We just made history. We were all a part of the first debate between political parties on the same stage in Antigua and Barbuda. And it was done by youth for youth. We can give yourselves a round of applause for that. Now tonight, I have the mammoth task of trying to thank all the people involved in making this event possible, so I'll try to do it quickly. I'll start with Pastor Spencer and the entire team at the Precision, Precision Center. I know, 
When we first came together as a committee and decided to put on this forum, we unanimously selected the Precision Center. We thought it was the perfect location, perfect ambience, perfect facilities, and we were determined to get the Precision Center. And I'm sure when we sent our correspondence to Pastor Spencer and told him that we wanted to get politicians in his building debating, he thought we were absolutely mad. But he heard us out, he allowed us to meet with him, he understood where we were coming from, and he gave us the opportunity to put on this forum. And he not only agreed to let us use the venue, but he gave us the full, his full staff, the full complement of his staff. So I want to personally thank all the staff members, the persons in the multimedia room, the persons who were here last night helping us to move chairs and tables and put on tablecloths. Thank you all for all that you've done for the last few weeks. Thank you for taking all our calls. Thank you for all your assistance in making this event happen. I also want to say thank you to Shan Merchant and the entire team at Lime for being with us at the onset and sticking with us all the way through to the end of this program. Roger Perry and the entire team at Yum Yums, thank you for your support. To Nikenji Drew, our multimedia assistant, our photographer, videographer, our designer, from the very first time we called you, you've been extremely professional and quite particular with your work. But when we look at the quality of the work that you produce for us, from our logo to the video, the documentary that you did here tonight, I think we can say that your creativity definitely helped to steer the ship. <laughs> Matty Noyce of Daddy Designs, thank you for ensuring that our committee is so well uniformed. We definitely appreciate it. Hawkeye Security. Now, we know Antiguans are passionate about their politics, and so we knew that we needed officers who were well-trained, <laughs> reliable, and could provide us with the support that we needed tonight. And Hawkeye Security and the Royal Police Force of Antigua and Barbuda definitely stepped up to the plate, so I want to salute you officers for your hard work. Thank you to Signcom for our lovely banners. Talk of Antigua, we thank you, and the thousands of Antiguans logged in across the nation and around the world, thank you for streaming our event on www. <laughs> streaming our event on www.talkofantigua.com. And in that vein, I must give another special mention to Claire Foster and Trent and the entire team at the Precision, Precision Center, the multimedia team, for giving us a secondary streaming platform. You guys have been here with us working hard for the last few nights to make sure that all the IT issues are sorted out and that we could stream online and we definitely appreciate your hard work. To Marvin Strucking, we definitely appreciate your financial support. Special thanks to C Major Productions for designing the lovely invitations that each one of you received. And thank you to Illuminat and Paperclips for assisting with printing of those invitations. And to Gamal, Goodwin, and Party Bands are us. We thank you for the bands that you gave to us to assist with security. And I hate to refer to Nayakoms as a sponsor, Nayakoms as a sponsor, because by providing us with our moderator, they have been an integral part of this entire debate. And in unanimously requesting Marcela Andre George as our moderator, we as a committee knew that we were getting the type of professionalism and poise that a historic event like this demands. So Marcelo, we just want to make it, make it clear that we never had a shred of doubt that you were the perfect choice and the perfect candidate for this job. Thank you for proving us right. Thank you. <laughs> to the youth groups, you made our event possible. Now when we decided to do this, to put on this forum, we had no idea how we were gonna choose and select the persons to be in this audience tonight. It was like planning a wedding. And we had no idea where to start, but we decided to go through the Youth Affairs Department and when we, decided, when we selected you, now that we've selected you, we appreciate your patience, we appreciate the fact that you adhere to the rules, you adhere to the guidelines, and we thank you for supporting our event. To the ushers that assisted with parking outside, assisted with getting people inside, assisted with seating people, 
We call upon you personally for assistance and you answer that call. Thank you all very much. Oh, to the executives and panelists of the Antigua Barbuda the Labour Party and the United Progressive Party, when you first heard of the National Youth Forum and the organizing committee, you had no idea who we were, you didn't know our motives, you didn't know our agenda, and I think both parties thought that we were somehow part of a ploy by, by the opposing party to set up something, and, and I think that's a testament to our independence and our nonpartisan stance throughout this entire process. Because no one knew quite where to play. But you took the time to meet with us, you took the time to listen to our concerns, and even though you highlighted the fact that our demographic is a relatively small segment of the, the voting block, you still came, you still supported our event, and you are all good sports in participating in this debate. And we thank you sincerely. So Mr. Marshall, Mr. Semester, Ms. Hurst, thank you for putting up with all our calls and our repeat calls and our emails and our follow-up emails and our visits and our calls again and our emails again. Thank you for your patience and thank you for understanding the vision that we had as young people for this youth forum. And further to our panelists, Senator Messiah, Mr. Lovell, Senator Nicholas, and of course, Mr. Nicholas on the other side, and Senator Marshall and Senator Weston, thank you sincerely for agreeing to be a part of this debate. I want to say a public thank you from the organizing committee of the National Youth Forum for helping us to make history in Antigua and Barbuda. And I want to... And I want to say thank you on behalf of all young people across Antigua and Barbuda for taking the time out to address us and address our issues and our concerns. Special thank you as well to the press, to ABS TV, to Observer, radio and newspaper, ZDK, Antigua Chronicle, and not just for covering this event tonight, but for supporting us, Crusader, Crusader of course, but for helping to keep the public informed through our press releases and appearances and media events over the last few months. Thank you all. Now, to my fellow committee members, I don't think anyone will ever be able to fully understand what it took, the amount of effort, the amount of time that it took to get this event planned and put on. And they don't need to. We must remain grounded in the realization that our reward, we won't get any material gain, there won't be any immediate praise that will satisfy us from this event. But that slight shift in the political discourse that will start from tomorrow morning in Antigua and Barbuda, our reward comes from the idea that politicians and candidates in general elections have to, must, accept that we will not tolerate, I guess you can call it, the, the run-of-the-mill partisan politics and the, the rhetoric that we are used to. And we will ask for more, we will demand more. And, <laughs> candidates will now appreciate that our generation, the social media generation, generation Y, the millennials, we will not be blown by whatever political wind passed through our parents' houses, but we will be voting based on... <laughs> we will be vo voting based on substantive issues and how they will affect our future. So, I want to acknowledge you, the young men and women who were willing to defy the status quo when they told us that it could never happen, that we would never be able to get the Antigua Barbie, the Labour Party and the UPP on the same stage. One person said to me that it was more likely that we would get Unku and Onion on the same stage together <laughs> for the burning flames before we got the Antigua Barbie, the Labour Party and the UPP together. So I think the National Youth Forum should go after the burning flames next. That's just me. <laughs> but I just want to acknowledge our committee members and one of our members, Yendi Jackson, he is, he couldn't be here with us, he's overseas on national duties, but I know he's watching us from Japan. And I want to ask the other committee members to come to the stage, if you could just give them a round of applause as they come, starting with Mr. Carlin Knight. 
Mr. Kyle Christian, our able timekeeper for the night. Mr. Regis Burton. Miss Aziza Lake. And I think it is necessary to acknowledge the type of tenacity, the type of nerve that it takes to call young people together to put an event on like this and to manage and to organize and to lead and to delegate all these strong personalities and not just the committee members but the candidates and the parties as well. And so I would like you to give a resounding round of applause for our chairperson, our leader, Amaya Attil, as she comes to the stage. My name is John White, and we are the organizing committee for the National Youth Forum. At this point, I'd like to ask our moderator and our panelists to just join us for a quick photo op. So if you just go around the table and Marcel, if you could join us. Mr. Carla Knight will now escort the panelists backstage. Ladies and gentlemen, as we arrive at the, at the end of the first nonpartisan youth forum and debate, I want to thank you all for coming out to our audience, watching and listening across all the different media platforms. Thank you for tuning in. To everyone that supported us, thank you so much. Now please make your way to the exit and get home safely. We thank you so much for coming. Have a good night, ladies and gentlemen. Sir.